Hey, what's good, people? This is the Option Podcast. This is episode 127. That looks like Lori. <laughs> Lori Akamura. But we're going to find out. The episode starts right now. All right, people, you have asked and you have asked and you have asked. And for me, asking you shall receive because for me, I've got to give the people, give the people what they want. Dun, 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 dun. What's up, Lori? Hi. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good. How are you, Jason? I think I am so excited because for years and years and years, we really only get, get to just see each other's faces on the social network. And we have some interaction because, you know, we're both making moves in our wheelhouse. I'm, there are levels to this. So, so, of course, I defer to you more, more often than not. And then I, I, we, I get to see you in person, however briefly. My wife was going to drop kick me. I had to, um, my nanny was Socially watching. Socially distance, right? Physically yeah. distance. I know. <laughs> <My na> <laughs> uh, Kelly, I love you very much, wherever you're at. Um, <laughs> so, um, and it was really cool. No, well, I had to leave because my nanny, um, I had to get my nanny who had my kids. So, uh, so I got, to, I stayed just long enough to hear your, your thing. And we're going to talk about that on the podcast. We're actually going to start there because that's, that's how I steer our, our, our car and it is your responsibility to make sure if i drive us both off the cliff you bring us back okay um, okay i'm good deal? sounds good co-pilot shotgun all right so <laughs> wednesday right uh national girls and women's sports day right wasn't that awesome wasn't it awesome to have you me and jason olive all in the same room with um la volleyball club which is in los angeles uh it's inland and we have a very very diverse team uh, of black white asian you know which south bay i'm a, I'm a south bay coach you, you're going to see predominantly white right for, for the beach and, and, and indoor and it was great and our entire co coaching staff is black as african-american or whatever like my mom's black so the entire coaching staff is diverse and talk to me about just being in the room um, just with a bunch of girls wow. who, who, you know, Jason's good with the hook. He, he can sell <laughs> ice to an Eskimo, right? He, he, right, can, he right. can convince the Virgin Mary into posing for a centerfold and then make her think it's her idea. Okay. So, um, he, um, maybe we delete that part, but, um, <laughs> but Jason had the hook, right? These kids are interested in volleyball. Me as us as coaches, we keep them engaged and they're all in this room. And then you walk in and walk me through that. Sure. Well, first of all, I mean, what an amazing, you know, 30 year relationship that I've had with with Jason Olive, right? There's a lot of history, there's a lot of trust, but there's a lot of appreciation because Jason is one of those people that um, really embraces, right, what what anything is about, right? When he gets when he gets into it, like, for example, building the culture that all of you guys have built at Los Angeles Volleyball Club, where the kids are curious they're um inclusive right they're you big know they're word. still but That's they're a still big word. yeah, yeah i mean but they're still also looking to learn right they're still they're really like excited about their journey you know not just with volleyball but just like to meet new friends and you know and meet the coaches and kind of you know get some insight as to you know what all of you have to share with them and not just about volleyball right thing i love so much about you know, the clubs that do this is, you know, I know you guys are teaching them about fitness and nutrition and, and mindfulness and, you know, all these other things that, that right now are sort of on the tip of everybody's tongue. But before, you know, like when I was a kid growing up, like none of that, and, you know, it's like, but if you wanted somebody to be more mindful about it, you yell at them louder. Right. <laughs> that was, that was the, you know, the but trick, why, right? coach? Why? Yeah, what do you mean why? Get over there. Just not to ask me yeah. why, just go. Why you know? in your vocabulary, yeah. little, exactly. little girl. <laughs> yeah. But so I'll tell you that, that, um, so when I arrived, uh, yesterday it was the first time because of the pandemic, right. It was the first time that I was able to see the kids, um, up close and personal, right. To actually be in the physical room as opposed to the virtual room. Um, but also it was the first time that I had the chance to, um, to see the practice, you know, area, the facility, right. Vista Del Mar children and family services, um, which, you know, that we could spend a whole podcast talking about the value of foster care and, um, you know, and assistance for, for children who are basically forgotten. Right. Um, fortunately for the girls and, and families in Los Angeles volleyball club, you know, they, 
Um, they don't live in that particular situation. But I think for them to be around other kids who do, right, and to see, you know, how, um, how things impact people differently, right, that come from a different background, what a valuable lesson, just, just that alone, right, is such yeah. a valuable lesson. Yeah, but VDM, um, yeah. Uh, let me interrupt, VDM was an or used to be an orphanage, right? Yeah, I, well, it, it was a lot of different things, but it used to be primarily an orphanage and one where my understanding and in, in kind of researching, you know, VDM, it, it is the best kept secret in Los Angeles. Like I even I didn't know it was there. This right? facility is, I mean, it's facility hidden in plain gorgeous. sight. It is it's hidden right, yeah. in plain sight. It's right out there mm -hmm. in, you know, just the best kept secret. But it, it did have origins, you know, dating back to almost like a, an, you know, the, the old um, sort of stereotype. You think of an orphanage as like a cold, dark you know, kind of scary place for kids, yeah. right? And, and, um, with nuns you know, but, with rulers and stuff. You yeah. know, but, yeah. but this couldn't be furthest from the truth, you know, in what it is now, right? A green open space with sports and art, you know, and music at the, at the nucleus, you know, of what they offer these kids that, that are there. And not all of the kids that are in residence, you know, Vista Del Mar, my understanding is not all of them are, um, you know, without a parent or guardian. Um, some of them come there for, you know, learning disability assistance or um you know mental mental health assistance and whatnot to help them just get the tools that they need to be able to then go back to you know the schools that they came from or the the communities that they you know that they may have uh, come from and found vdm but walking into that room for me it, it was a big deal and jason and i had talked about it right because um you know he's been I, i've done a couple of these talks on national uh, girls and women in sports day for him before but um um this would be the first time that we, you know, got together for the club, right? right. To do something. Yeah. We, we had intended to do something last year and the year before, but obviously, you know, Auntie Rona, you know, said no. So, so right. we, uh, we, you know, this was the first time. And, um, you know, I love the energy of kids. I mean, I've, I've done talks like these quite a bit, you know, but, I've, but I always find something new. Doesn't right, it feel fresh it. and new though? Every, every time. time. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. feel like you're just going through the motions of this. Not this. at all. You know, um, I actually, they didn't fall asleep. You know, I could yeah. see everybody's eyes. Right. <laughs> it's very much they like, being, but it's very much like being a theater performer. Like my major in college was acting when I, when mm. I, and when I got on the stage, you know, you do like 10 shows or you could do a hundred shows and everybody's like, it must feel like just being repetitive. And, and some professionals, you become numb to it, but mm -hmm. it depends on the audience. Like if the, that, well, you have it, this yeah. energy, like the kids didn't say a word to you, but you felt the energy, right? So, well, I felt so when I you feel this faces, energy, doesn't it know. feel fresh and new? Does, right, does, if right. every time, like you have a different crowd like that, it feels fresh. Yeah. Well, sorry. what was so nice mm -hmm. about this time? So, so usually there, you know, when when we do talks like this, it would mm -hmm. be like before or after practice, or maybe at a tournament or, or something. And there's there's very little opportunity for the parents, you know, to to get involved or to even be in the same room, right? There were one or two parents maybe, or one or two families. But what I really loved about the day that we had, you know, with LAVBC was there were um, a lot of families represented in the room you know a lot of moms and dads that i talked to afterwards that were like gosh you know i played sports when i was their age and i don't even think they understand like there were very few you know whether it was very few volleyball trained coaches or female coaches or coaches who weren't history teachers and taught foot you know i coached football too or you know so so they um you know they really had some observations on behalf of their kids i said well my, some of this might have gone over their heads you know tonight but even if one or two things sunk in, right? And that's the whole point, right? So National Girls and Women in Sports Day, you know, for us in the volleyball community, there's a very special relationship, kind of like as I shared with the kids, you know, there's a very special relationship to the sport and so much that Flo Hyman, um, silver medalist from the 1984 Los Angeles Olympic team and yeah. just, you know, an icon, right? Icon yeah, in, Flo in was... sports. Um, Flo was really the, the inspiration and her, you know, her approach to equality, right, gender equity, um, inclusiveness, or just kindness, like basic human kindness, really, what it is what it comes down to. Um, but somebody who was so humble about like how good she really was, right? I mean, how how and, and not only you know from an on the court perspective, but how impactful, right, her um, her career, her life, you know, has been um, not only off the court, but in uh, you know in, in pass in her passing right after her death. So um, for the girls to understand, you know, the connection, right, especially, I mean, you know, every sport is important, but particularly for the volleyball, for them to understand what that connection is, if that's the only thing that they took away from it, that they are part of something much bigger, 
right? And they're contributing to something that's much bigger than um, just the hundred girls that they see at practice every night or, you know, or whatnot. No. Then, then and, that and, gives them a sense of community. And that's right. when I, I want to chime in here on that. Yeah, um, yeah. Because we, talking about the parents dynamic is, is so, so important, but I want to start with the kids and then work up to the parents. I think for girls volleyball, 10 times more than boys, boys and men's volleyball, the feeling of camaraderie, the feeling of sisterhood, and the feeling of picking each other up when you're down, the feeling of doing all of these things together, um, has a special significance for girls and women's. And and and, I'm, and it's so convenient to, to say that so close to National Women's uh, and Girls <laughs> Sports Day, right? Because I've been look, I've been coaching 20 years, and it mm -hmm. took me year 11, right? You know, and I had good mentorship. You know Mario Trebich, right? He's mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. eighty fourteen, right? The assistant, from right? Eighty fourteen, right. assistant what? Soviet Union, and then the Netherlands, ninety two, right? Um, ended up coaching his son at Hunter High School. His son, oh Alex, wow, his son Alex. <laughs> so that's how small our world is, and that's New York. So, but it took me, and I've he was my mentor, and he taught me a lot, but. Mm -hmm. It took me year eleven in my twenty year coaching career. It was more twenty one, but. You never say anything to a girl or a woman for that matter, college, high school, that will alienate her in front of mm -hmm. the team. Mm -hmm. It is the beginning of team implosion. It creates toxicity that you think is coming from somewhere else when you don't really know that you're that you're probably not even the one that started it, but you're you're just throwing wood to the fire, right? Maybe someone else is toxic on the team and, and right and as a coach teaching through camaraderie and 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 i do tough love come do i not look like the kind of guy that's, that, that's gonna <laughs> that's gonna tell you get your ass over there right uh, and i do tough love but i never i'm very careful about the way i say or do things that will vilify or or make the team alienate that person yeah. and if someone yeah. on, the team, on the team is toxic laurie um if you, i continue to coach that way that toxic person's gonna stick out on its own because you don't really you don't know right away if you're coaching everybody you know this 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 male driven uh, hardcore you know bullsh uh testosterone fill <laughs> way right so um i wanted to i wanted to talk about that but before i go to teachers i wanted sure. you to chime in because there was something you wanted to say yeah well no i mean i i agree you know because the the language we use and it's not just you know you, you said in the talk it's not just your verbal language right it's your you know your body language your attitude like how you walk into the room like hey look at me you know i mean it's, it's all of that but to your point about the alienation part like so i i do a lot with athlete safeguarding right and um and you know, I think one of the things about sport that's so great is that no matter what language you speak, like, you know, English, French, uh, Japanese, you know, German, Portuguese, whatever, uh, when you get in the gym, like the, the language is, you know, volleyball, right, or sport or whatever. And that's true, not just for the pro players, but it's true for people like me that are behind the scenes, right? You have the commonality with that. But your point about the alienation is, you know, your language verbally, but also your language like physically can can do what you're talking about right so you have to be very careful about you know um you know not uh taking for granted that everybody speaks the same language or speaks the same slang or yes. you know, anything and make sure that you're also you know showing with your actions yeah. right not just your words you know what what you're trying to do to bring everybody together yes. right? and that's a lesson not just for sports like that's a lesson for business i mean yeah. you know your business for everything too, right? sanford yeah. meisner said an ounce of behavior is worth a pound of words Right. For our audience listening, for you, obvious is obvious, but we, oh, we, we you know, I, I got like 15,000 views an episode and we owe it to our audience to, to remind ourselves that they're listening. And I'll say it again. An ounce of behavior is worth a pound of words. If you ask me a question that I'm not comfortable at answering, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this. That's a paragraph. Right. Lori, right there. <laughs> for the audio version, sorry, you missed out. Uh, but um, yeah, so let's skateboard to the uh, the parents dynamic and sure, yeah. the reason why a lot of people quit club um especially for indoor i mean we'll, we'll do a humorous thing about indoor and beach right in fact <laughs> fuck it i'll do that right now all right indoor volleyball parents are worried about playing time the gym is mm -hmm. hot as hot as hell right um the 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 kit kat bars and diet pepsi are four dollars a piece the parents have to stand online to pay money to possibly see their daughter or their son play it is an uptight environment and by the time they leave the parents look like 90s rappers all right and, you know <laughs> and you're like relax you've won right uh but then okay so the beach 
they're sitting on beach chairs it's free to get there they're they got a little bottle of wine in the back they're eating <laughs> chicken fingers and sweet potato fries for breakfast uh their kids not on the bench right it's double so uh just drawing the picture of the differentiation but so from the parents perspective there's always for indoor going to be a contra mm -hmm. con controversial element because I'll just say it outright. Every parent thinks that their daughter is better than they really think they are. That's just, um, that's a statistical fact. If you ever did, done a survey, you, you'll, you'll right. see we're right. And, and you probably have someone like you who, who's <laughs> neck, who's like neck deep in this. Um, how do we, and I have a bunch of answers, but I gotta let you talk girl. How do we, um, how do we create an LA volleyball club where uh, the the parents yeah. are involved? They're engaged. They're 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 they they have healthy dialogue. Uh, they're supportive. Um, what are some clubs, and I guess some tournaments and some some environments missing that that we that Jason Olive, uh, Dane Blanton's doing the beach portion, by the way. So I'm, and I'm right. gonna be coaching both, right? Uh, what a great coaching staff, uh, Kam Kamalu, right? Young, young, beautiful mind. So, but what do we, and how did Jason, and how do you think that we create this environment where there is parental harmony to yeah. go with the sisterhood? Well, so I'm gonna answer that by giving you an anecdote. Right. And so I've been involved and a lot of people don't know this about me. They think uh, I just popped out of nowhere, but I was involved in running clubs um, when I first started out, you know, and coaching as a young coach, like young, you know, stupid coach. Right. <laughs> I didn't know anything right oh at that God. point, just knew yeah. how to play. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I've seen uh, the large club model. I've seen the small club model. I've seen clubs before social media. I've seen clubs, you know, after social media. But this story I tell a lot um, because I think it sort of just you know, breaks it all down on the parent side and the parents can make or break, right? The, the, the experience for the kids, you know, and um, like my first year of coaching, I think it was like 18 or 19 years old. I was, a, I was, a, it was in college still, right? I, I would move down to Southern California, USC. And there was this opportunity to coach, you know, for a really small club. I think there was only like three, I mean, back then there weren't single age groups, right? They were, they were all like 14, 16, you know, 18s and under. Right. right. So, um, I had this parent that, well, this isn't the anecdote, but this, this leads up to the anecdote. I had a parent, a father of three kids, right? And um, two of the kids, da three daughters, you know, so it makes it even more illustrated, but two of the daughters were of playing age and one was just almost, she was like nine, you know, eight or nine. And now everyone would say, yeah, get her involved. But back then in the eighties, you know, there weren't a lot of opportunities for kids younger than the age of 11 or 12 to play, right? Um, because the youngest age group was 14 and under, right? So there, so um, in this case, the dad, uh, you know, and, and presents himself really well and, you know, and professionally and all that. But then we'd get to the tournaments and I'd have um, parents from our team, parents from other teams and coaches that, you know, you get to know, right? You're all playing the same division. You kind of get to know each other professionally or whatever. And uh, they would walk up to me and be like, could you do something about that guy? Like, he's horrible, right? And it, are you listening to what he's saying? And like, honestly, I, I couldn't hear what he was saying because... What he was doing is going to the opposing team's side, standing, and you know, some of these gyms, right? I mean, you have to stand outside the doorway to be able to get your, you know, your, your, your proper serving distance or whatnot. Yeah. And he would stand on the other side of the court out of earshot of me. Um, and he would be, I can't even repeat because I don't want to, what he would say to those, those young girls, right? We're talking, I coached in a 16 and under age group. So we're talking kids that were 14, 15, 16 years old. And you know, calling the things that if you were standing on the, you know, on Skid Row in, in LA, you know, you still wouldn't hear language. That yeah, bad, they, they wouldn't even right? do that. Yeah. I mean, some of the stuff, like some of the dads that would approach me to, as the season progressed, you know, from other teams are like, yeah, even I don't know what that term means. So for sure, it's got to be bad. Right. And so, so that's one example of, you know, although the three daughters, you know, probably would have had a terrific experience, right. In volleyball, the second and third daughter actually didn't end up continuing because they were so you know embarrassed they're horrified by the behavior that the father displayed but also that he wouldn't stop right it ended up with a ban from the region and you know it, it really got quite serious you know in terms of his um verbal you know was abuse he, was right, he kind of a boy kids. absolutely th a thousand percent you know if you watch his his interaction you know and so this is a parent that just it's not for the kids right it's it's all about 
you know, his experience. But the anecdote that I wanted to share with you, and you know this, you know, I, I, I love this family. I love everybody in this family, but the Sato family, right? So Gary Sato and I in the mid 2000s were involved in, you know, another, another, you know, type of model for club volleyball. And, uh, you know, Gary's great, right? He like has all these tricks and you don't realize it's like, it's like Uncle Gary, right? Who tries to give you some advice and you don't realize at first that that he's actually giving, he's teaching you, right? It's a teaching moment. And then you walk away, and you're like, darn it. Like, I get it now. Like, that was exactly what Gary was talking about. So Gary was sort of the, the master coach for a small club that, that we were, you know, helping to get off the ground. And they had this great practice facility and everything looked, you know, everything looked to the naked eye like, oh, wow, yeah, this is great, right? This is the ultimate. And, uh, you know, as you can imagine, as you know, you've been doing this long enough, like anytime you start a club, in the first year, which is the same, you know, sort of dynamic that LAVBC, right? LAVBC started from nothing, right? I mean, he, Jason started that from scratch. Just well, so a driven so, I mean, savage. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that, that's it. That man. But in in yeah. our case, you know, we had a lot of kids um, that were, you know, either had left other clubs, or there were, there was a little bit of of um, an onboarding process, right? We called it the bad news bears syndrome, right? We took every kid that wanted to play because that was our purpose, right? If you want to play volleyball, we're going to find a place for you. And also we're going to work really hard to, if you want to play in college at some level, you're not all going to be able to play at division one, but oh, by the way, there's scholarships available at division three, there's financial aid available, you know, available for division two and, you know, there's NAIA, you know, so we tried to open the doors, right, to, to, um, yes, teach volleyball, but also this was this was about like a life change, you know, a life lesson for these girls. Like you can go to school, right? Even if you're not playing, you know, at at, at one of the like Texas or you know, if you're not at the number one team or anything, you can still play and have a meaningful experience. But you're going to come out of this with a degree and you know, lifelong friends and and everything else. But the parents, right? Back to the parents. And so Gary noticed that. You know, kind of early on, you know, in the in the competitive season, that they, the the language, right? And Jason, I know you've you know you you've had to address this too with your teams, but there's like, oh, serve it better, right? Or jump higher, you know, that kind of that kind of cheering, if you will, right? You know, the and not the oh, good job or side out or you know, not something that's more benign. It was like, oh, can't you hit that harder? I mean, I couldn't believe, you know, when I would hear um, things like that. Okay, so Gary being, you know, the wise sage of volleyball, right, and, and human behavior that he is, um, the following week that we started, you know, hearing or noticing the, the language, right, and even in practice, there was a mom that was just like, I don't know if there's anything worse that you could call besides a helicopter, I mean, she was like a drill, you know, mom or <laughs> a drill parent, right, and Jess was all over this poor girl who just really wanted to have friends, you know, she wanted to be a part of a team, and the mom would just be like, well, that wasn't hard enough, that wasn't fast enough you didn't get there fast enough and so one day you know like, what's your experience in volleyball are you a coach oh no i never played sports but the language being used you know sure. to, for the daughter was very um, not only alienating but it was very derogatory you know it was very negative right, right. toxic and, and all that yeah, so gary put because out being a coach is not relevant right exactly if you, yeah right if you, you have know, a coach right, yeah. who knows the sport doing that you know they're wrong too right <laughs> the way it's the it's the delivery yeah, yeah. it's mm -hmm. the delivery right so Gary put together Volleyball 101. I thought this, I, at first I wasn't quite sure if I understood what, what he was doing, but then once I saw it unfold, I'm like, ah, there lies the lesson. And at the following practice, you know, the, the courts are all set up. The kids are over with their coach on, on court one. And then on court three, Gary's with all the parents dressed out and ready to play, right? And the, the idea was you're going you're gonna to go through a practice you know, the same way your daughters are going to go through their practice. They'll be over there on that court and you guys will be over here in this court. Um, about 35 minutes later and people were puking into the trash cans and, you know, they, they didn't make it through the warm up. I, I don't even know if we got the ball handling, but Gary put them through exactly the same paces, you know, that they would be that the kids went through. Right. The same right. warm up, the same stretches, the same drill, the same, you know, um, sort of like. Uh, um, information for the day, right? You know, the right. whiteboard, you know, kind of breakdown. And uh, yeah, after the the jog for the warm up, and everybody started puking in the trash cans, and you know that they could could make it to the trash cans. Um, there was this sort of like group consensus that okay, we get it. You know, we we get that it's harder than than it looks, right? And as everybody's passed out, lying down on the court, like again, not even to the point of ball handling. Um, you know, Gary gently reminded them that okay how you're feeling right now right like 
think about how you're feeling right now. You don't feel, you don't feel really that great, right? You feel like maybe you're hungover or you should be hungover or whatever. Like, remember that feeling the next time you tell your daughter to run faster or jump higher or serve better, right? right? Or hit the ball harder. Remember that because your words have consequences, you know, and then gave them some, you know, it wasn't really, the point wasn't really to berate them. The point was to give them some tools, right? Some language to, to use with their kids, right? right? And that's part of like building a culture. It doesn't always work, you know, in, in a perfect world, you think, oh yeah, all this stuff, if we do this over and over, it's going to work. And that's what, it, it doesn't always, right? But that's what's so um, unique, right? And so um, fascinating to me about what Jason Olive is doing with LAVBC, yeah. right? And, and it doesn't, you know, the, the parents have to subscribe to it, right? The coaches have to subscribe to it. The kids will end up, you know, subscribing to it. But um, it's a culture shift, Right. And, and not that it doesn't happen in other clubs, but I rarely see where the dynamic is such that the kids, you know, are still allowed to be kids and enjoy the process and discover like what exactly their skill set is in volleyball and that it's actually quite high. Right. right? I mean, you all have a, a pretty big percentage um, of first time uh, first time athletes, not yeah. just first time volleyball players, but like first time athletes. Right. Yeah. So that's no other sport like in it. and of itself. And uh, you don't yeah. see too many sports like that. You no, know, no, I mean, I you hardly see any. That. Yeah, you hardly see any. But yeah. you also have, I think, you know, a pretty good percentage. And, and again, it's not 100% buy in from the parents. But um, just based on the interaction that I had uh, the other night, you know, with some of the parents that, that were there that stayed that made the, you know, made the effort to come and see what it was all about. Um, it's very clear to me after doing this for so many years and being on both sides, right, the sponsor, a, um, a, a coach, an administrator, a club owner, whatever. Uh, that these people get it, right? Yeah. That clearly they've they've been given some information that yeah. they have accepted and are trying to put into practice, right? Even the way they approach their kids, you know, after the the session was over, um, the the way the parents sat together and the kids sat together, and you know, there's there's some camaraderie, right? Already um, already beginning, you're already developed, right? But beginning right. to show itself to like a third party, like myself, right? I'm a, I'm right. a sort of an outside observer, right? Looking in at all of this. Um, and that comes with a lot of a lot of effort. It does. Right? I mean, it comes with so much effort. Every day, every minute that you spend in the gym is a learning opportunity, right? Every day, every minute that you're out um, competing, especially during during COVID times, right? It's it's a learning opportunity, but it's also kind of a stressor, right? It's a potential triggering <laughs> opportunity, and, you know. And and that's I think that's what's so unique about what you all have have been able to accomplish, right? With the culture, right? right. Setting the culture. And uh, culture, which is the starting point. And culture is, I think, wh where you're, you're, I guess, if there's an operative word to describe this and this, this, this beautiful, well put uh, soliloquy that you did. For me, there was more like a through line. For me, it was, are you a coach? Mm -hmm. And the best way, the, the short version of that is that coaches are people too, right? You have to be a person because a coach has to be a person in order to succeed. And, and it reminds me of this very, very short story that just get, helps me get my point across. I heard someone arguing with, a, um, these were two players, right? And there was a player who's been playing for a long time and he lost to an indoor middle. And all, all the indoor middle was doing was, was paint brushing, like missing the on twos on the beach game, which, which were dangerously close to carries. And there was no um, adjustment for this formula, for this guy he's never seen before, has the height, has the athleticism, and is doing this one thing that's killing this long time player. So at one point, he just threw the ball at him. When they switched sides, he just <laughs> threw the ball on me and it just missed his nuts, right? So, and he says, you are so lucky we're friends. And then he threw another ball at him. And then he, when he rushed him, it took like four of us to hold him down. And big guys don't like to be held. So you eventually, got, <laughs> right? You got to get off him, right? Yeah, okay, okay. I'm getting off you, please. Please, I'm getting off you. Don't hit me, you know? And then the four lines was F you, right? Uh, um, why don't you play a tournament? And then the, the inexperienced middle said, why don't you win a tournament, right? And he, <laughs> he goes, F you, I've been playing this game for 16 years. And the last line was, yeah, and you still suck. <laughs> so the moral of this story is when someone's like, 
You're no one to question that coach and this coach or whatever and this and that. And my question is, did it ever cross your mind that someone could be doing something for a long time and still suck and still suck? All right. There are lawyer. If there are lawyers out there who have a degree or that are still practicing do doctors, don't even get us started with doctors. Right. Still practicing medicine. Let that guy Malone, who everyone chose to go after Joe Rogan instead of Malone. That guy still has a license, whether it, whatever you want to say about him. Um, and and I think that's the point I'm trying to make. And I think you know what I'm getting at here. Mm -hmm. You have to coaches have to remind people that the reason why they're good coaches is because they see the people, the person element. They see the parent who saw the USA volleyball team in, two, in, in um, uh, the last Olympics miss 14 right. serves against Argentina. I don't think you have to be qualified, uh, a qualified coach to say, don't you think you should keep some of those serves in? Now, as right. far as the how, the heavy top spin and doing stats on on teams that are better serve receive on against the jump floater versus the, the, the heavy top spin, the serve percentage of missed top spins versus this and that. Yeah, that, let's bring a coach in for that. But for someone to be like, Sparaz know what he's doing. He's done this longer than you've lived. He's forgotten more volleyball than you know. That is bullshit. That, and that is disingenuous. And what those coaches are missing, and this is, and I'm getting back to it. See how I Kanye West this thing? Um, uh, the reason why a lot of these clubs are, are failing is because there is a level of arrogance that comes with their pedigree. It, right. it comes, right. it, there is this level of, uh, of defensiveness uh, that's a human element that coaching has not cured <laughs> from them. You wanted to say something. No, I mean, I'm, I'm shaking my head because that's, that's true. Right. The, the, you know, to put yourself as a, as a club director in this day and age, right. You mm -hmm. have to put yourself in a, in sort of a different, um, different box. You do have to put yourself in a little bit of a box, right. Because there are, um, new elements to deal with, right? There, and the people have been doing it for a very, very long time. They know that. Some people jump in, they think, oh, well, you know, it's easy to run a club or it's easy to to start that culture or it's easy to coach volleyball, right? But I those but it, those, but, those know, people yeah. are the reason why coaches become defensive. If exactly. someone says it's easy, that's that's not professional, that's personal. Exactly. That's not it's attacking. not easy. Yeah. No, it's not easy, mm -hmm. right? Nothing is easy. If it was easy, we'd be doing everything at, yeah. at level 10, right? Oh, Everybody man. would be able to do everything. It'd be a billion dollar industry if it were But it's the humility factor right so i was lecturing a couple years ago on like the part that humility plays right in your path right and even people who are humble you know or they feel like they practice humility can be perceived as arrogant sometimes or you know or or the perception right people are going to believe their perception is their reality essentially um but you know in terms of the coaching profession it's like i do think you know that there are there are times where the arrogance becomes a barrier Right, it becomes a barrier not only to the communication that the coach has to the player, yeah, but then also the the management right of the of the team, which also includes the interaction with parents, yeah, right, with other coaches, with referees, a, with a character armor. You know, yeah, actually, mm -hmm. absolutely, you know, the character does, you know, does count, right, and you always want to. You know, you always want to either leave a practice or a tournament. Like I said this the other night, you know, you want to be better at something, right? That that than you were when you walked into practice or when you came to the tournament or you know, even if it means like, so so like I was telling the kids the other night, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in Japan, right? And it's like volleyball arenas right stadiums you know that are just for volleyball it's like oh that's my church right yeah. you know it's that like, one in japan you like, were talking about yeah oh, my oh God. yeah it's, it's right? like and there's a ton of church. them right there's a ton of them even even for beach volleyball yeah. right there there are stadiums that you know 30 40 years ago were yeah. built just for beach volleyball right yep. but um there's a sense of respect you know that and discipline right and, and again it's cultural right so like um uh, when you go to these, whether it's V League, Pro, or National Team, or when our teams have played in Japan, like the arena is spotless at the end because everybody takes their trash, they pack it out, they it's you know, respect they, in the they, church. Yeah, they expect. Church. But I was just, at, and I'm embarrassed to say this. So this is my alma mater. I, I was at USC not long ago at the Galen Center watching uh, men's volleyball, and you know, obviously because of COVID times, right? There are very few people right that are allowed into into the uh, arena in section. other words it's a normal home game but go ahead. it's a normal <laughs> <laughs> are we talking no. about men right we're talking no. about men, the men you're talking about the it's men's actually, game right it was, yeah it was actually yeah then, this, then, it was a no, then it was a normal game. game but with even so few people like 
the place was trashed after in the in the areas where people were sitting like they were popcorn and you know all this other stuff and i'm you know i'm, I'm packing myself like japanese style like taking my popcorn bin and taking my drink and you know everything else and i see yeah. other people looking at me like what are you doing right but then i also see like if someone looks at you doing that nine times out of ten they're, they're gonna, gonna start do doing it, it too yeah. yes yeah and that's the thing you know so so culture is you know both inherent but more so 90 percent of the time it's learned yeah. right it's learned behavior and that's that's what you guys are doing at lavbc and that's to me the most fascinating part yes not just you know not just with lavbc but in any club you know that can establish that culture to me yes. that's the really most fascinating part it's very much really like COVID. 100%. It's, I mean, I mean right? And, and this, and this, it's so convenient in this climate that we get, we get to say that it's like COVID. Well, yeah. If, if you're, and, and, you know, if, if they're, you're they're, near they're, someone, right. Um, right? Well, that consideration. It's contagious. So, so I, you know, I, I was just going to say, I had this, I have another close friend, you know, that I've known about as long, just, just about as long, maybe a couple years longer than I've known Jason. Okay. Um, but, you know, she was a collegiate volleyball player. She was the first high school All-American from the state of Oklahoma. Her brother played on the national team, won a championship at Pepperdine. Her name is uh, Missy McCaw Freddy. And Missy uh, returned to live in her hometown of Tulsa. I mean, that's a city, it's not a town. I mean, <laughs> she, she returned to Tulsa right after all the years being away and living in Southern California and other places. And, um, you know, she's got kids of her own and part of her legacy, pro, you know, project, right? Her, her own personal legacy is she mm -hmm. started a club. Nice. Right. At about the same time that Jason started, you know, LA LA DC. So it was really yeah. interesting to watch, you know, the two of them sort of go through this process, right? Two people that contributed in a very significant way on the court. Right. And early on in their playing careers, but then now also as parents, right, as business people like, you know, very they're both very entrepreneurial. It's been really interesting to watch, you know, how uh, her club is called Ultimate Performance Volleyball Club in Tulsa. And it's a very similar um, um, vibe, right, that, that that Los Angeles Volleyball Club has in so much that that there's more attention focused on um, character and behavior and culture. Right. Like what, you know, the team building, um, which is which is a part of it for you know, a lot of clubs, but it's also the live by example. Right. Yes, the the sort to, of yeah. like, yeah, we're, we're all in this together kind of thing, you know, and and let's face it, like that part of the country was not really um, adhering to as strict COVID protocols, you know, as maybe other parts of the country. But her club, um, they've been they've been under, you know, in, to, in order to compete at tournaments, they put themselves in self-isolation. They've done the rapid test. They've done, you know, similar to how. I think you all have taught the girls at LA Volleyball Club that that there is a responsibility, yeah. right, to your fellow teammates, but also to the other members of the volleyball community that you're going to be interacting with if you're if you're lucky enough to be able to continue competing during such you know uncertain times, right? Agreed. Check yeah, this out. There he is. Oh, that. there he is. There's our guy. Look at that dude. You can but, you can but, see number 14 above the, <laughs> above the net, Lori. <laughs> above, way above the net. Well, I think yeah. that that to me is so great. Like I, I showed a couple pictures during that presentation and the girls were like, huh? You know, <laughs> the parents were like, what? That's Coach Jason, you know. But that that's another part about all of this, right? Is the the um you know, there's all these, you know, catchphrases for it now, like representation matters. And if you can, you know, if you see it, you can be it, you know, things of that nature. And while they sound kind of corny, they're actually very true, right? The, yeah. the, the premise behind it is very true for the, for the, the young girls that you're, you know, you're really like shepherding, like you're mentoring them, right? You're not just coaching them. Like you're really, you know, giving them um, some life skills, right? As well as volleyball skills. So for you, Jason, and Jason Olive, and especially for Kamalu, you know, being a woman, right? So, especially being a color. So young and like, so bright. Yeah. She's and, so but, young you know, and so bright. She's a great example mm -hmm. of, you know, if you can see it, right, you can be it, right? So the girls who understand like what kind of career that she had as a player, but now also, you know, as an, not just a coach, but an administrator as well, right? right. Looking for the look ahead, right? The right. long, the long-term strategic plan. Um, but it's, you know, one of the things about the, the national, and I really wanted to make this point because I feel very strongly about this. So like, I'm a really big supporter and I have been my whole career of boys and men's volleyball, right? As, as well, right? It's not just about yeah. the girls, it's about everybody, you know? Well, it's probably how we know each other. I've been, that's I've probably, been, yeah, I've been, I was gonna say, it's probably how we know each other, yeah. Like girls volleyball is, has only been as recent as California, right? Right, right. And, and right. the Summer Beach and LA well, Volleyball, yeah. And, and you know, you know, and you mm -hmm. heard me say this the other night that the National Girls and Women in Sports Day, 
you know, while, while it is an opportunity for, you know, the girls to sort of align and, and celebrate together, it, it's, it doesn't happen without the male advocates and the male allies and the male role models that have been involved in, in especially in volleyball, you know, as well, right? Because it's not always a bad thing to have a male coach, right? You can't, you know, there, there aren't, uh, it's not a us versus, the, or it shouldn't be, right? Sometimes right. it's made into an us versus them thing, but it shouldn't be, right? There's, there's a space for everybody, right? Mm-hmm. Non-binary, transgender, you know, male, female. What, I, I looked at, it's funny, I come from Hawaii and, and the driver's license application now for Hawaii, I think has like nine possible genders that you can identify with. And I'm trying to learn them all, <laughs> to right. be honest. I'm not, I'm not altogether sure, but you know, there are allies, right, that, that are not just female, right, not just girls and women in sport, um, but they promote and, and sponsor, right, and lift up um, the girls and women and give them, you know, equal opportunity. Um, and I think it's important to, you know, to acknowledge that and to recognize that. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's just as much of a crisis um, of extinction, you know, of boys and men's volleyball that, that, that there could be some women who can sort of return the favor, you know, and, and amplify, you know, that as well, right. Amplify these new teams that are coming on board. Um, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of opportunities, you know, both ways, right. For gender equality. If you ask any boy or man, tell him to look back and ask him what got, got him into the game. Nine out of ten times. I mean, I didn't do a, st- a, st- a stat, but I'm willing to actually do it to do a survey. Yeah. All right, a big survey. Nine out of ten of them will say a girl got into volleyball. Maybe right? their mom. I mean, look at right? the look in the United States of America. Look exactly. in the state of Texas. If you see a volleyball player in Texas, a male volleyball, Riley Salmon, right? Yeah. Match, never even played NCAA, but wound up on the national team. The captain, no less, six foot one, right? Which, which is, a, which is kind of like a, a midget, or that's not, that's not the correct word, but a little person, tiny little person. Um, I'll bet you, he thought it was a girl sport, got interested watching the girl sport, and then played yeah. men. So there, there is a, a, a give and take. And I'm, I'm, mm-hmm. I, this is leading to a question, but there is a give and take, like a back and forth where the men did this. Then all of a sudden there's more male coaches than, than women. And then men have to help raise the women. And there, there, there has to be this give and take. Do you see where I'm getting? getting well, yeah, I, but there's also been some really significant women. So I, I was just going to reference the McKibben brothers, right? Yeah, all Riley, of them. And, and, the, and the McKibben, yeah. you know, the McKibben family, right? Diana yeah. McKibben. Kid is, brother is the setter, right? Was he a yeah, setting? Uh, yeah. Was, he's, was he's he the starting USC. setter? The, well, so so I mean, all three all three brothers uh, were uh, had gone through USC, right? Setter, outside hitter. No, I'm talking know, about the, the kid, the, the kid youngest, brother who's Jameson. there now, Jameson. Yeah, he's there now. He's a setter, right? He's but, a starting the setter. The mom, right? Uh, no, I don't. I'm not sure. Okay, <laughs> I don't think sorry, so. I don't think he is. He's won every but, game um, I've seen him set. But he's on the team. But he's yeah. on the team. You know, he's a contributing player to the team. Got it. But um, their mom, Diana, right? Not only is she regarded as you know, being sort of the catalyst, right, for all her sons to get involved, but she's also like one of the top, you know, in the history of all volleyball in Hawaii, right, one of the top most, you know, highly regarded and um, uh, top people who have given opportunities, right, for other other young, you know, young boys or men or, or girls or, you know, whoever, right, whoever wants to play, she's found a way for them to play. So there's a perfect example, you know, of a woman, right, who plays a significant role, not only in her own son's uh, path to volleyball but in probably other people's sons and daughters you know path to volleyball yeah. so i think there's you know really what it comes down to is you just have grandma's to aunts yeah, recognize yeah. yeah you have to yeah. recognize all the people involved right that can potentially be your sponsor your ally your you know supporter or even just a fan right? right even just being a fan of volleyball is is you know is something that can uplift right something that can inspire right taking your own kids to watch volleyball if they don't have any experience with it or if they do even you know better yet like it's great for kids to see a higher level of volleyball than what they're playing because ultimately what happens is they start to mimic you know the same behaviors or they start to understand like what you're trying to teach them and break it down you know at their grassroots level and then they actually see what it's like at full speed yeah you know you're like see that's what i'm talking about that's what i'm talking about that's how you hit that ball right <laughs> you know and yeah. then they can actually see it it's it's better for them to relate to it right and then and then perform the the skill themselves there i, I mean yeah. right now honestly as far as caring for the sport and paying dues the hard way uh, regardless of their family lineage or whatever, mm-hmm. there's probably 
I mean, if I'm not a volleyball person looking in, there's probably not two more influential guys than, uh, than the McKibbins. They're, they, you know what I'm saying? Every, they've had to qualify for the main draw and had, didn't have points, and they just show up and they qualify and they make the draw. Got to qualify again, show up, qualify, make the draw. Show up, qualify, make the draw. Riley gets hurt. Oh, Ty Loomis picks me up. Uh, Madison and him win San, San Francisco, and then they rolled in the dirt because that, that's how Ty Loomis likes to celebrate. Well, and, and, well, and they're mm -hmm. gold medalists. Let's not forget, all three brothers are gold medalists in snow volleyball. Yes. Right? Yes. Represented Steve the Asher. U.S. in snow. I mean, people Steve laugh Asher. about snow Plug volleyball. Plug in Steve Asher. You, yeah. It's, yeah. And it's, it's, it's common, right? They yeah. represented the U.S. at an FIVB snow volleyball event overseas. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so, so, it, and I always love to like amplify the McKibbins because the, anything volleyball, their game to try, right? Anything, yeah. um, you know, any, any sort of like uh, outside their comfort zone, right? Their game to try. And yeah. what they're, what they're also demonstrating now in their creative, you know, sort of endeavors, you know, like the, the documentary, the amazing the, um, race, you know, yeah. the, all the films and all that. Yeah. The amazing, the, race. amazing race and everything else. Yeah. Like they the are finalists, finalists the amazing Yeah. Race. And they're yeah. transcending volleyball. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're, they're making it, they're kind of making it cool again. Right. Yeah. To the people that don't already know. I mean, a similar thing happened when, uh, after you remember after Beijing, um, summer Olympics, uh, Misty May trainer was on dancing with the stars. Okay. Right. And, um, you know, it was the beginning of social media and such. And, and you know, Dancing with the Stars, is, it's not really my cup of tea. But, no. you know, of course, I watch it if somebody I know is on it. But then, yeah, I didn't watch it, Amazing I, Race. Yeah. Like, I our, never watched yeah, it until the McKibbins our, came on it. Right, right. That's the thing. And, and people outside of our community, right, do watch those shows. And that's how they become familiar with the stars within our volleyball community. Yeah. Right. So you look at, in Misty's case, I think the, the woman who was handling her social media was like, okay, she just gained like a half a million followers you know, of dancing with the stars. I mean, think about that. I, I would, I mean, I didn't do this poll. You're right. I, I've done other polls, but I didn't do this poll, but, but I'm your experience bet, can suggest. Yeah. I'm willing to bet that probably 90% of that 500,000, you know, increase, right. 500,000 person increase in her social, probably 90% didn't know a thing about volleyball or maybe no. didn't even know that she was a volleyball player no, who had it, just won a gold medal. It's very much like Jerry Rice. Right. Look, Jerry Rice yeah. was a popular yeah. player, right? 100%. I mean, he was popular enough where he didn't need to be that transcendent, but dancing with the stars. Spike. That, I mean, you wouldn't think that that would help in, in the sports sense, yeah. you know, but Paige Van Zandt, with, Paige you know, Van Zandt awareness. UFC, uh, a fighter, mm -hmm. a former UFC fighter, Paige Van Zandt. Um, not even like, I guess as far as tears, and I, I don't like labeling people in tears, but <laughs> she was very much like where the McKibbins were in the AVP, right. like as far as rankings are concerned, and that's where she was, and she became more popular. Gabrielle Reese, you know, uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, Jason Olive. You, you, I remember you told the story about the billboard thing, well, like that yeah, huge ass, I mean, that huge ass billboard we were talking it's about. In yeah. Incredible to me. I mean, had we had social media back in the when, when that was early nineties, yeah. right when that incident happened, he'd live in outer space. Um, he'd have a, enough money to live in thing. outer space. He, you know, Jason wouldn't even live on earth if we if there was social media back then he have enough money to build a space station and <laughs> and and commute his volleyball girls back and forth via shuttle so, that's how well, much well, money i mean he that's, that's right the, the, the look i wish he could have been sitting where i was 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 you know when when i made that mm -hmm. comment right and told that story about coming out of the train station in japan and yeah. seeing this like 60 foot tall i mean looking you know up 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 60 foot tall billboard old school right yes. billboard right not led I'm from not, New York. You know, somebody, he had had one... get, somebody had to get up there and and put that you know paste a that bunch up of there, people right? had to a yeah, team right? team uh, um but but it really comes down to especially in a place like japan that the fascination and the fandom if you will you know that was surrounding the people that were taking pictures and you right. know and all that it came from the fact that they recognized him as a volleyball player yeah Right. Although that was that campaign for him, for Calvin Klein was, I think, I mean, the two campaigns that Jason did in those 90s eras was Levi's, you know, 501s and Calvin Klein were like among the most, you know, most widely used and most popular of ad campaigns like ever. Right. Right. But yet here's the connection. The connecting thread is people remember him from volleyball and that's right. what drew them you know, to, to that, um, you know, that particular location, right? That train right. station, now we, one of the busiest train stations in the world. Now we find ourselves talking about Jason a lot in this podcast. So let's, <laughs> let's educate our audience. Jason Olive, former All-American at University of Hawaii, um, semifinals NCAA. I think 
won like one of the first right to likeness lawsuits. I think I think yes, he, I think, he, first. I think he, kicked, first, he, he kicked their ass in court until they pleaded mercy. Right? <laughs> um, basically, for the people listening at home, the Hawaii was saying he wasn't allowed to make money while modeling. And his argument was he was already a model and it was already doing that before. Uh, right. um, his star arose in Hawaii and it was a legitimate argument. And mm -hmm. if the NCAA is teaching us how to be leaders and entrepreneurs, they, it would be it would be NCAA hypocrisy. Right. So he he before this whole right to likeness thing came out, he right. in the 90s, right. this is 93 and 94. He gave them an ass, the ass kicking of a lifetime. Uh, and then and then Uvaldo Katz rose and, and eventually his um, his volleyball stardom rose with him. They made the semifinals lost in five sets to Penn State. That's how far back we go. So that's Jason Olive. And I met Jason Olive doing all my children in New York. And he had a he had a billboard, actually, um, you know, the modeling stuff and this and that. So Jason Olive to me and back to you. Jason Olive comes up to me and says he's got something brewing at LA Volleyball Club, wants me on board. And I told him, absolutely not. Uh, the junior scene and the parents and the politics and me me coaching some of these South Bay kids who were just like sp spoiled rotten. And, and and I flourished in that because I had a strict style that that gave them a mixture of the discipline. And, and Dane can be nice if he wants and John Mary can be nice if he wants. So I told Jason, no, I'm, I'm over that. I'm, I got the podcast. I got... You know, Jeff Samuels on, on the AVP scene. Mm -hmm. I, I've been coaching some players, Chris Austin, Manhattan Beach, you know, Earl Schultz and Jake. I got them into the draw in Hermosa. So on a small scale, the way I like to work, flying under the radar, doing doing gangster shit like you and me, like you, like very much like you. you know, like a lot of people don't know you, but if, if they right, write about you, right. they'd be like, and I'm oh, okay with that, by the you way. You have to be. <laughs> oh, is, isn't it great to not be out there where like every little word you say, right? This, right? this well, is one of them people, things where... People talk like they know me and usually it's the 50% that's not very flattering, but I, I'm okay with flying under yeah. the radar, right? I'm okay with that. Yeah, and, and you know, I'm a kid from Brooklyn. I, I could be, I could fly under or fly above I'm, I, and I'm still the same person you met the year before that and the year before that. So Dane actually was talking about the idea of doing LA Volleyball Club Beach. Dane Blanton. Right. Olympic right. gold medalist. I remember that. Right. For people listening at home, Olympic gold medalist, the only male player to have a gold medal, an NCAA championship as a player and a coach, and an AVP crown. No other player, not right. even Karch, hold that holds that distinction. In fact, they don't even give coaches medals in the Olympics. But um, so I told Jay, Dane the same thing. No, I'm not. No, I'm 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 fine. I'm good. Because Dane saw the work I did at Endless Summer. Endless Summer ended up leading the nation in recruitments per capita uh, with under Deron Forbes and um, Beach Volleyball National Event. So that, that, that whole correlation. But when they came together and they told me where the gym was and they told me who they were recruiting, who they were working with, and kids who are not exposed to the sport, mm -hmm. I'm like, that's my cup of tea, Laurie. <laughs> that's that's my cup of tea if you know my history that was that's always been my cup of tea city college right i got right, invited to right. nekva uh recruiting three kids from harlem uh two soccer players and a basketball player and, and in one year you know a legit middle and two oppos so it's always been my work to to have people the inland people california say but i say people of diverse cultures because right. New York, uh, uh, brings, volleyball's for everybody. Yeah. It's a perfect well, sport. New for York that. brings new meaning yeah. to the word diverse, diverse right. culture. <laughs> right. And you, and at the end of the day, like you said, it's one language. I set for a team called Bameso. All right, Bameso, I believe won nationals in 2004, 2005. That was Batista. That was Caballito. That mm -hmm. was those guys. I set for them for the bid tournaments and stuff like that. It's the only guy on the team that spoke English. Ulysses, who runs the program, his wife, who was on the Dominican national team. Okay, fine. Um, Paul Lamb, who won in 96, the Polish American team out of Brooklyn, supposedly Brooklyn, um, set for them two tournaments. I was the only guy, but they knew what this was. They knew what that was. They knew it. They knew it. They knew what this was. Right? They know the signs. They know they sign language. We all know the sign language is not polish right. right it's not spanish so the zones are the same whether yeah. you know the numbers are the same yeah, right? so so i only brought that up so people listening you know because i don't want to be like a, like you and me sitting here like a couple of douchebags like name dropping <laughs> this name oh the that inside guy. jokes yeah. no we have to know i mean we have an audience we owe which my audience has gotten bigger since i started having the doctors and um my major in college is, is theater, so I've had some actors on. Um, I have a friend who's who's in the, the Tina Turner musical, and I think that's up for a Tony, right? The, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So, right. so Jo, that's who he is. Model did all my children for six years. Um, Tyler Tyler Perry's House of Pain. Well, right? he's also humanitarian, 
right? He's a humanitarian. He's an activist. I mean, Jason, a true activist, about, a real, right. real activist, not, not a symbolist. About, right. And not, not, yeah, not a symbolist. But the mm. thing about Jason Olive that has always, you know, really sort of endeared him to me is every step of his career, whether it was in the entertainment industry or the modeling industry or the fashion industry. He's a photographer. He's a very accomplished photographer, you know, and then there's also the volleyball, right? But every step of the way, there's always been a part of him that has given back, right? There's been a philanthropic side of of Jason, right? And I remember, and it might've been one of the first chances that that you and I had ever, you know, uh, met in person, but when he did, when he started the JL Foundation, right? And um, you know, sort of like the, the, the play, you know, the play with the pros kind of aspect of it. I mean, it was, you know, it was meant to be, I, I don't know if it was meant to be as long lived as, you know, the JO Invitational, I think was, uh, uh, was an idea that everybody thought, hey, this is great. But I mean, 25 years or so later, right. And it's still, you know, alive and, and, uh, you know, yeah. um, but, but I remember it was, it was sort of like a passion project because he was very much interested in refurbishing you know, the Hudson River Park um, area, which now has been totally gentrified and yeah. is a great like, Pier 25. area for exercise and yep. you know fitness and culture and, and everything else. But I remember that first year, right? I mean, he was literally doing everything himself. He was. Right? Not only Well, all there was the media, Chi DiMaggio like, first. Chi, Chi right, DiMaggio. Right, right, right. And, That's then, right. and then but, Chi, I mean, Chi just said the hell with this and then Jason... Right. Uh, but, yeah. but I mean, I'm talking everything from and there have been times along the, the last 25 years where, you know, I see him loading up the box truck with the equipment. I see him at 5 a.m. in the morning setting up the, the nets. Right. I, you know, I hear him on the phone um, getting with, you know, friends from the entertain, like all your mutual friends. Right. That come out and help give some some different life right to to that aspect of it. like you're you know, you're the celebrity that you all have in that world um, definitely helps to lift up. The philanthropy that we're trying to accomplish in yeah. the you know in the volleyball world or in the sports world but you know jason's a connector of people and i like people like that right i'm i'm into yeah. that i try to be that myself i mean it doesn't always work out the way you want it to but yeah um well, you're the six degrees of separation gives back. sorry right right you're, you're yeah the six degrees I thought, of well, no, you're right yeah you're the I kevin the bacon of called. yeah well, it worked and it, and it works both ways, which right. as you get older, right? I mean, when I met Jason, we were, you know, we're teenagers, right? But now we're in our 50s and it's like, okay, as you get older, you know, that that six degrees of separation sort of, I call it three phone calls, right? And, yeah. and you know, excuse my French, but it takes three phone calls to either figure out if someone's a jet or if they're full of shit, right? And and that's literally how it works. You know, I mean, I just, I just am going through this right now with, you know, with a, a, a group um, not known to the volleyball world that's doing a volleyball activity and trashing people in the volleyball community along the way you know mm-hmm. and my you know as it gets back to me right my thing is like well wait a minute i know some of these people that you're you know you're trashing in no way is what you're saying you know no uh, there's no uh, way that that happened have no you merit. talked to yeah. them yeah. yeah have you talked to them have you reached out to them have you you know whatever and so you know when you do find those people that you can trust right and i've i've you know, I, I'm just as guilty of cutting people off, like, like severely, if I'm like, I'm not feeling you, you're, you know, toxic, you're whatever, okay, I'm not going to do anything to retaliate, you know, no, but contrary, your to, contrary to popular belief, but I'm just going to not, not but help no, you, you're, but I'm, your health is I'm important. done, your health is important, exactly, maybe, maybe exactly. at that time in your life, right. I, I well, could and, do without and this really person, it, yeah, mm-hmm. exactly, and really mm-hmm. when it comes down to it, is that when we're all ready to, to leave, right, this earth, like, all we have left is our reputation and how we treated people, I right agree. and it's not always going to be perfect like there gonna be some people that look back and like well i treated them kind of like you know poorly but yeah. then there's going to be a bigger percentage that okay i gave that person that opportunity yes it, it might have cost me something it might not have but yeah. i don't really care because the feeling i have in giving that person a chance or giving them an opportunity they have to run with it right they have to make something of it all i right. did was open the door just a little bit so they could they could step through and that's sometimes right? if some people that's all they want that's exactly I mean, that's it. all i asked for and, you know and, and, it's exactly it yeah. i mean volleyball you know, volleyball community wise, I always talk about, um, you know, and, and I've been I've been sort of amplifying the National Girls and Women in Sports Day, you know, in, in different ways. Right. But um, throughout the you know, throughout the weeks prior had been sort of sharing stories about, you know, other women that that um, had been uh, most of them in volleyball, but, you know, had been involved in sport and kind of where they are. But the one group um, that I actually didn't talk about too much at, at the other night was uh, um, 
a group of interns that actually started out as either my player or players in a club that I was affiliated with, you know, back in the, wow. in the nineties. Right. Yep. And, um, they all were quite accomplished. Right. I mean, if, if you could, if you could fill out a, a, a poll or a ballot for like all American in those years, like these, these women, you know, girls at the time, these women would be on almost every, you know, every ballot, right. Every poll. Um, and, but they were also, you know, uh, very interesting people, right? They had interests outside of, you know, not all of them wanted to be professional volleyball players or national team players or go to the Olympics, right? Some of them did, but they, they all wanted to, you know, utilize their ability in sport to help them get a college degree, you know, to get a job and, and to move on to something else. So when I was working, I, I worked for a long time at uh, Mikasa. And I did talk a little bit about the man I worked for as one of my, you know, sort of like sponsors and allies, a guy named Dick McCoy. He was actually who I was traveling with when we saw that big billboard of Jason. Oh, cool. He was the he was the president of Mikasa, the ball company, not the China and plates company, um, but the ball company. There you go. Um, and uh, and, you know, was himself a very big champion of women you know, period, right? Had a daughter who played volleyball, had a son, super creative, like filmmaker, you know, and, uh, and his wife was really, you know, really all about like empowerment, right? For, for everybody. But he allowed me to start a, an internship program, which was geared towards student athletes, you know? So, you know, it's hard for student athletes, and especially back then when they weren't allowed to make any money or do anything, not even just make money, but in, do anything outside of, you know, practice and school and, and everything else. So we started this internship program. And of course, you know, I had, I had my selfish motives for it. Every kid that played for me for that three-year period was automatically enrolled in the internship program, right? So it was like 17, 17 or so women. Um, and when you read the roster of the interns, it reads very much like a, like a, like a history book of women's collegiate volleyball, right? There's some career leaders on that, you know, on that list. There's some All-Americans, there's an Olympian or two. But at the time, you know, they were learning how to do something, you know, to, to enhance their skill set off the court, yep. right? They had to, you know, and, and it was fun for them because they had to arrange, you know, the company's um, very substantial investment in the volleyball festival, right. you know, which was very, the, the event still is around, but it was a very different event back then, right? And they had to get creative. It was before cell phones existed. You know, we were using a lot of like <laughs> calling cards and pay phones and kids, yep. you got to Google that to figure out what those are. Yeah. But, um, you know, it was challenging, right? Very, yeah. very challenging without uh, a lot of the technology that exists today, right? But um, <laughs> I keep in touch with the majority of, of those women. And, you know, they've gone on to, to do some pretty amazing things in different areas of business like not mm -hmm. everybody went into you know the sports world and that's and that was sort of the goal right go yeah. whatever you're going to go into just utilize the skill sets that you've developed being a part of a team especially a high functioning you know club or college team right. and uh, and then by the way if you do go outside of the volleyball you know or a sport world um take us with you Right. So yeah. we had one gal that went to technology. We had, you know, some that went into entrepreneurship. We've got a couple that are in the media that, you know, always try to draw back on the volleyball experience or just the fact that they are form, you know, they put in their bio, like this host of this, you know, event is, is a former volleyball player from, you know, from the University of Rhode Island or, you know, whatever the case may but be. But more exclusively women, right? Just women, just women yeah. empowerment. So, I mean, and we're, exactly again, it. we're neck deep into this men's gangster stuff, but there's nothing <laughs> more important to talk about than, than the empowerment of women. I wanted to yeah. talk about something what you were just talking about that I classify sure. as, that I have labeled and classify a right, righteous chain reaction. So I'll just leave it at that. But quick caveat, quick question. Do you remember your home phone number? Uh, well, well, yeah, yeah. actually. Oh, I growing do. up, I mean, do you still remember yeah. your home phone number? I it's just a stupid it. question I wanted to throw in there and, and, and we're back. So, I don't have a home phone anymore. No, but, but I, growing I up, no, I remember well, you know my why, home. Though, we, we remember our home. We had to memorize it. Yes. <laughs> we had to memorize it yeah. or, or write it down because they're, I mean, now somebody asked, the other. I got caught the other day, um, I was supposed to give my my cell phone number, right? Yeah. I mean, I know my cell phone number, but but for a second I'm like, <gasps> and I looked at my phone and I yeah. had to, your I computer had to say, program oh, had to say, second. please yeah. wait, right? <laughs> Loading on oh, that little circle, you know? Yeah, or I mean, but but yeah, you, you know, I mean, we had to memorize our home phone number, you know, our name, like where we lived, our address, and our home phone number because, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you as a kid, if if you got lost or you know, so you had to know how to be able to contact your home. Well, here's what I was getting at. Uh, um, and our, our next subject matter and we we drove into it perfectly because you you um <laughs> you have the steering wheel on um you know i don't know i mean england the steering wheels on the other side and, and we all can't drive together right but 
Um, I call this a right. Uh, our next subject matter is righteous chain reaction. All right. I love I'm gonna, that. I'm going to draw a picture for you and bear with me, but don't get undressed. Um, <laughs> football. All right. Uh, right now, the hot button issue is Rob Flores is suing the NFL um, for for reasons that right. if any of if even one of those three things are true, if people are in a lot of trouble, like someone's paying one hundred thousand dollars for you to lose a game. Right. And if you lose a game, you look bad as a coach and then you lose your job. So. Right. So. Um, well, especially if you're a coach of color. Yes. You know, yes. So but yeah. right now, there's only one black coach. In I America. know. <laughs> and you know what that guy had to do to keep his job? Uh, his yeah. worst record is eight and eight. <laughs> he had a season without Ben, without Antonio Brown, of course. Big, big surprise there. Right? Big surprise, Le'Veon, yeah. Without Le'Veon Bell and finished eight and eight. So this guy had to, to keep his job. His worst season had to be eight and eight. Think about that. So, oh, my God. Um, And this is for the people listening to me pontificate here. Um, bear with me. I'm getting <laughs> somewhere. I swear to you, I'm getting somewhere with this because this is going to translate to women. Uh, and the reason why you don't see a lot of black coaches is because when it comes to the interning system, the, in, the intern system and the development system, that's everyone's like the good old boys club is at top. No, the good old boys club trickles to the bottom to their kids. My kid's interested mm -hmm. in this. He wants to intern this. He wants to intern that. So now right. it's no surprise to see a, a Kyle and Mike Shanahan. It's no surprise to see uh, Bill Belichick's son you know, mm -hmm. doing play mm -hmm. calling or like uh, the assistant quarterbacks coach. In five years, I guarantee that guy's going to be a coach. Like maybe not, yeah, a, maybe less. not a head coach, right? So the point I was trying to make was the reason why you don't see a lot of black coaches have opportunities is because the intern system, the entry level is, is not, uh, the door is not cracked open for them. Mm -hmm. You were mm -hmm. talking about give something back, right? Like um, I always say, if you take the elevator to the penthouse, push lobby, push lobby, send it back down, right? So that's what Kevin Spacey said, and I believe him. Yeah, send it back but, down for the next guy, right? Yeah. So translating men's vol uh, uh, coaching, black and mm -hmm. white coaches, the league is 70, 77% black, okay? Or well, people identify with being black 72. Um, and only one black coach. Yeah. So now enter the women's scene, NCAA, for the people listening at home, there are 25 times, maybe 100 times more women's volleyball teams for college than there are for men. Okay, Texas doesn't have a men's team. Syracuse doesn't have a men's team. Uh, Minnesota, Michigan, uh, um, Notre Dame, none of these schools have NCAA men's teams. Mm -hmm. uh, all of them have women's teams. And yet, the majority of the coaches are, are men. So, the reason why I said I was proud of what you did, you created a system that was more women than men, or to me, it's not like all women, uh, um, that allowed them to spread out and succeed on and off the court. And it's a question and an answer. I think if people want more women's coaches, there has to be one, a general interest in women who want to coach, because it seems like guys want to coach more than, more than whatever. It seems like, uh, like I, we want to see some uh, more black firefighters, but I grew up on Flatbush, and I'm telling you, a lot of my friends I grew up with, they don't want to be firefighters. All right, they they don't, they're not trying to jump in no fire. So, so me, to, the, one that has the combination of the general interest of of wanting the coach, right. um, as well as the hook for people to to, to hook women into coaching, and mm -hmm. the in, and the intern system. The floor is yours because this is where I have to hand off to the baton to the anchor, <laughs> the anchor who knows how to win this race. Well, so so this is a great topic for us to, to end on too, is, is that first of all, it's about interest, just like you said, you know, it's also about the uh, opportunity, you know, as far as the, the apprenticeships or the internships, but it's also about education, right? It's also about providing um, a mechanism for people to train and learn and develop their skills in order to be adequate um, at their at their job, like right? if you're going to be a coach, if you're going to be an administrator, um, I don't think those things have to be mutually exclusive to men and women. You know, I think that there just has to be equal access, right, to those things. Because I am very much, you know, as much as you hear me talk about, um, you know, girls and women in sport, I'm also I've had the equal number of male assistants or staff members or members of project teams as I've had female, right? Because for me, it's not about just being totally exclusive to one you know, one group or another, it's let me find the very best person, A, you know, but B, if there's a person who demonstrates 
interest, like you said, right, or a particular um, affinity or skill set or some some sort of aptitude, right, for uh, business or learning. You know, oftentimes I've approached you know those people and said, you know, you seem to be a really good communicator, a really good salesperson. Have you ever thought about potentially a career in this, right? Oh yeah, but I don't know how to get started. Okay, well, how can I help you, right? How can I assist you? Is it is it even just a question of putting together a resume? Is it giving you some practical work experience? You know, to your point about the internships. So I'll tell you a great story. And actually it's a it's a men's volleyball story. So one of my very dear friends who was a who was, you know, who worked for me, he's always gonna say, like, I was your assistant, I worked for him. I'm like, no, you worked with me. Right. That's yeah. part of the, the exercise. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. But I'm, I'm going to I'm going to say his name because I'm just so proud of him. So his name is Matt Knudsen and Knudsen is from Orange County, California. He's this big strapping athletic guy that loves every sport. Right. You'll, not not totally out of the realm of possibility to see him like surfing in the morning and then, you know, running or, or playing basketball or playing volleyball. You know, and volleyball happened to be the sport that he settled on. And how we became acquainted is uh, through Gary Sato, a mutual, you know, mutual friend and acquaintance. And when Gary and I were doing this club back in the mid 2000s, you know, there was, uh, it was really sort of like haphazard, right? We were just, we were not trying to take over anybody's turf or territory. We were trying to make a space initially that, that kids or, or players or even coaches that didn't already have an affiliation, you know, could have some place that they could start um, you know, learning and building and, and kind of gathering, you know, some, some resources of their own. And so we had, um, we didn't have enough boys. I mean, this is a common problem, right? We didn't have enough boys at the time to make a full team. And so what we did was we offered a private training program, you know, whether you were trying to get sort of some repetition, like reps, you know, to, to make your high school team, or if you're a college athlete that just needed to come work out, use the weights and, you know, and get a couple reps that way, you know, during the off season or whatever. And uh, so we had this young, young guy who ended up going to Pepperdine and he wanted to be a part of the private training program. And we didn't, you know, Gary, Gary wasn't available that day. No, there wasn't anybody available the day that he wanted to start, except Gary reached out to Matt, right? And this was the first time that I met Matt. And this is the lesson for, you know, for anybody that, that is meeting somebody for the first time. First of all, he was early, you know, which, which is great, right? And second of all, because he was early because he didn't know, he didn't know or didn't have the information as to whether the court would be set up or would there be, you know, a need to find a way into the facility or, you know, he didn't, he didn't have a lot of information and that was okay. He planned to come early and, and take the initiative, right, to set up the court and, and do whatever. And that's exactly what he did. He introduced himself, shook my hand. He said, I know I'm a little early, but I wasn't sure what the situation was going to be. You know, I see that the court's not set up. Can you point me in the right direction and I can, you know, I can figure it out. I said, okay, perfect. I can help you. You know, I mean, I'll help you set it up. Um, but then here he is, he set up the court. Uh, you know, I go back to doing what I'm doing. He's doing the lesson. This guy, the, the young guy comes over and goes, oh, that was so fun. Like that guy was great, you know? And, and then uh, before I had a chance to go tell him, hey, Matt, man, you were great. Um, the court's taken down, right? The floor is swept. Uh, everything is put away and the balls are over in the corner. He's like, I didn't know where you guys, you know, keep your ball. So I just put everything over in the corner, you know, so it's all together. I can move like, it for That's you new, you but want, that's right? fine. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, that's new. Yeah. I'm like, oh, that. okay. Strange. Yeah. <laughs> but, but here, you know, herein lies the first, the first impression, right. That I have. And, and, uh, you know, he's, I, I know only about him that he's a college, he was still competing at the time, right. He's a college volleyball player um, who, you know, who's not on scholarship. He needs some, you know, extra cash in his pocket. And so we're going to try to, you know, try to help him out, right. He's going to do lessons and he's going to coach club and, and whatever. And they were out of season, you know, by that point. Um, so I'm just like, Hey, Gary, you know, whoever that guy was that you just signed up, like, I want to know, his, I need his name, his contact information. I need to know, you know, all about him because like, we want this, A, we want this guy on our program, but B, like, I, I'm getting, a, my spidey sense is tingling that this guy might be like, where is he in his college career? And, you know, cause I had a project, right? I had selfish, right? I had a project. So a couple months passed by and I ended up having to be, I had this client that I was working with, this sporting goods, you know, brand and, and they were from overseas. And so it was, it was sort of like a, you know, I had to micromanage because you really want to make sure, you know, that, that nothing gets lost in translation. So I was really kind of overprotective of, you know, of this particular oh, sure. you know, client and situation. But as it turns out, you know, we got them interested in volleyball. Again, like to, to tell the girls, you know, the other night, it's like try to bring, even if you're not in a job necessarily that's working for a team or a, a college, like, okay, what was my, my 
take with this company, they were having a problem. I found them by accident. They found me by accident. They were having a problem. You know, I happened to mention, you know, after I listened to what their problem was, I'm like, why don't you go the sports route instead of the medical route? Because yeah. you don't need an FDA clearance for a product, you know, if it's sporting goods. And everybody looked at themselves around the room on this problem they'd been fighting over for like two, three years and spent millions of dollars in R&D. And they just looked at each other like, well, what the hell didn't we think of that? Yeah. You know, who's who's this? Right. She's not even a part of this meeting. Right? I wasn't even a part of the meeting. I was I was there because my colleague, my friend, we were going to go have lunch and I showed up early. And so, you know, you got to sit in the back of the room, you know, or the meeting. Right. So anyway, fast forward. And there was we brought them to the U.S. We got them to support volleyball in a very meaningful way with with dollars. Right. With cash money. And part of that support, <laughs> which doesn't was hurt. for. <laughs> yeah. Part of that support was for men's volleyball. Right. For the MPSF. Um, you know, and, and to to um, invest some cash and, and everything else. Okay, so we had this promotion and I'm, I'm a dummy. I, you know, I put my, I booked myself for two things, you know, at the same time, not realizing, and I had to be out of town for one of the three days of this trade show that they were going to be, you know, a part of. And I'm try just trying to think like, I just need somebody who just makes sure the whole damn booth doesn't burn down, right? I mean, this is a pretty, you know, easy assignment. Um, so I call Matt. Right. I say, hey, man, what are you doing on the weekend of, you know, I just I need some help, you know, for this event. Um, everything's set up. Everything will be set up by the time you get there. You know, I just need somebody on Saturday. I'm going back and forth out of town for this, you know, on the same day. I just need somebody to make sure the booth doesn't burn down. Right. And, and if you get any questions, just, you know, give them my card and say that she'll call you back and whatever. I mean, can you can you you know, can you watch my back on this? And yeah, no problem. So I leave the volleyball tournament, of course. Right. I leave. I come back. And the sporting goods dealer that we'd signed up to work, you know, the event to sell the product, she, she tells me, she's like, who, she goes, who is this guy that you have working the booth? And I'm like, oh no, the booth burned down. Right. And I'm no, like, oh my God. Oh no. I mean, if she says it like, you know, who is this guy? Like, who the hell is this guy? And then I was like, oh no, what happened? And she goes, I want to hire him. He just sold $14,000 worth of ankle braces oh, in God. one day. <laughs> and you're and like. You my mouth say that was, again. you know, <laughs> You're like, like, say, say what? And I said, wait, wait a minute. I'm like, Matt, you know, and I would, it wasn't surprising to me. What was surprising is her initial reaction that like maybe something, you know, had gone wrong. And she goes, he's fantastic. Like, okay, first of all, you know, she goes, first of all, he's cute as a button. All the girls want to come by and try on ankle braces, you know, and of course, like there's that element of it. Right. But, but really what it came down to was the information that he was sharing, even not knowing you know, every detail about the product, but the information that he was sharing authentically as an athlete who had had to use products like that, right. you know, knee braces, ankle braces, everything else. And the fact that he also, you know, understood because of being on a team that was being sponsored by this, you know, this company, he said, well, yeah, and also they really support volleyball, like we're here. And, you know, he had this natural, um, like marketing, you know, sales ability that I think went untapped for a long period of time. So I just, you know, I'm like, hey, you're hired. Like, A, I'm going to pay you really well for this, this day. Right? You're getting a bonus, right, for this day, right? But also, are you at all interested in working with me, you know, on this project? Right? what are you doing? What are you, you know, what what, what, what is your, your next life? step? Yeah. Right? yeah, you can still finish school. You can still finish, but, you know, playing your, your eligibility and everything else. I will, I will work around your schedule, right? Because he was that impressive to me. And when I met his mom for the first time, I said, uh, I said this was at this was at when he they got into the final four that year up at out at uh, uh, um, I think it was Penn was it Penn State or anyway they got uh, BYU sorry BYU that yeah. they uh, he played for USC and they were in the final four you know and, and uh, so anyway I met the the family and I just said I'm a big fan of your son like I'm such a big fan of your son and she looked at me and she goes she said the other I forget the, but she said his brother's name right and she's like you mean you mean the brother right I'm like uh, no Matt and she goes what you know like why is that mad you know yeah and, and it was such an endearing you know comment because you know they i think he had just been very humble about you know the, the his interests or his ability to do certain things and yeah. i'll tell you we worked together for quite a long time you know and and uh that's sort of like the jason story about seeing the big billboard right in um in Japan, uh, Matt accompanied me to the World Cup in 2011. We had some business, you know, with that same company, and I thought this would be a great, you know, it's an expensive trip. But is that also in Japan? It's a, 
in, in Japan, right? right? It's a terrific learning experience, right? Mm -hmm. Especially for somebody who's in volleyball. To see volleyball done in Japan is like you got to do. That's like the mecca, right, of, of volleyball events, and you know, which is why it's so sad. Tokyo had to be sort of abbreviated, but you know, the Japanese are great, right? At at not only investing in volleyball, but but making it a national pastime, and you know, more so to see the World Cup. Yeah. Right in Japan, it was still a qualifier for the Olympics back then, and our teams were playing, and you know, and and, and it was really a, a unique experience because it's it's a month long. It takes place in you know multiple cities. We were trained traveling all across the country and and taking in these meetings and you know and um, trying to do business right. And part of the exercise was again, this was like pre pre smartphone, right? I, I think I had a flip phone or something, but um, you know, he had to navigate his way just like I did, just like my boss made me do the first time I went, you know, to Japan. Like, yes, you get to see the volleyball and experience this level of volleyball with FIVB and, and the JVA, you know, the Japan Volleyball Association and everything. And this is how it's done. Um, but you also have to pay your dues. Like we got to figure out which trains we're supposed to take and you have to get the, the products ready for the demonstration. You have to give part of the demonstration and he knocked it out of the park every time. All right. So the point in that long, you know, long story is, you know, the support of boys and men's volleyball, right, at every level is just as important, right, and can be just as meaningful to a young person in their career as an adult. Um, Matt is still gainfully employed, right? He worked for years in the sporting good industry. He's working in a different, you know, industry now, but doing kind of the same, you know, type of engagement. He's a people person, right? The skill set that he has right, is, is one that you kind of can't teach. You just sort of have to, like, promote it. You just sort of have to, you know, enrich it, right, cultivate it. Um, but, you know, again, one of the best people I think I've ever worked with, right, one of the people that I've, I've really trusted a lot. But I, I have equal stories about women and young, you know, young girls that I knew when they were 10, 11 years old and playing club that yeah. then became, you know, interns and then became my, my assistant or my colleague or, you know, somebody that worked with me on a project. And that, I mean, you know this because you've taught, you know, you've coached kids to see a young person that you knew, you know, as a 10 year old, right. To see some of these, these young girls in this room that we had together, you know, the other night, and then to come back around to their lives when they either become coaches or, um, you know, play in college or don't play in college, but continue to, to keep volleyball close to them, right. As a part of the lessons they learned and the friends they made. And then they come back to you and say, Hey coach, you know, I'm working at, you know, Nike now, and I'd love to be your provider or, Hey, you know, I got Good this business, job. Yeah. yeah I, I passed my exam, the bar exam and I, I you know, finished law school and everything else. And my law firm, you know, has some money to donate to, you know, to a charitable uh, cause or philanthropic, you know, organization. Like I'd love to, to make that a volleyball program. See, that's, that's, that's how you build relationships that we're trying to get. Yeah, exactly. Well, the two, that's yeah. why we do what we do. The right? two, the two most important things uh, anyone's going to get out of what you just said in this this beautiful story was, one, talk to everybody because you never know who you're talking to, right? Like the the even the mom was surprised that right. she was talking about right. what son you just you just never know who's flying under the radar who who uh, either just has potential or just surprises you by being just an outright savage. Right. Um, two, and this is something I learned as a returning adult student, getting my degree in theater performance that I now mm -hmm. tell everybody, um, well, everyone that will listen that I'm coaching, but particularly the juniors. And you'll right. love this. Your reputation starts, start has started the day you said, I want to play volleyball. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, if you are a nice person, through high school, maybe through college, right? And then and then the person you were nice to, right? Maybe volleyball's not their thing. Maybe they they can't do, they can teach, right? Maybe they coaching, mm -hmm. maybe they're a recruiter, maybe this or that. And if you see them 10 years from now, the person they're gonna remember is the person that was a douchebag to them. And I said douchebag again, <laughs> twice right. on what podcast. Uh, or the person who was nice to them. And and it's you might that person might think it's unfair, but because in a ten year period, right, maybe you were an idiot as a kid, but you're 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 different. You're not that person anymore. But who does that person remember? And how mm -hmm. and and even if they do say yes, how much work do you have to do just to bring it back? So it's one of the uh, you're so you're acting very much, very much like acting volleyball. Your reputation starts mm -hmm. the day. My professor said the day I, you you say I'm, I want to be an actor, 
that's that's when your reputation starts and that's right. and that's how you use the word reputation so it doesn't sound like a, a more of a, a social thing for the kids where it's 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 more of how they want people to to see them for who they are right because right. reputation right. So a lot of people think reputation because the word gets a bad rap right it gets beat up a lot my i'm it's misused. About, it's yeah misused i don't want to be which is not good not, for my right? reputation you know because people yeah. might think this of me but if your reputation was already intact, they wouldn't think that of you because they know who you are in the first place. So, you right. know, so if your reputation's intact, you can use that to funnel and to send and to send to push lobby and send the elevator back down. You got somewhere to be, right? I Well, I have lots of places to be, but I, I carved out time for you. So. You did? Oh, good. Because yeah, but this is, Jason's this is sending me a whole bunch of texts to ask you questions. He's, I know, the whole is, time I'm looking is, down, he's sending me a text. Ask her about this. <laughs> ask her about that. So. Well, I, I so like I said, this is a busy week because, yeah. um, you know, I, I'm involved in the international world. The Paralympic. Uh, the, um, the, where I, where yes. World, world Paravolley. Mm -hmm. And we are just um, sort of like in the midstream of the Paris 2024 cycle and we in fact just had some calls you know this morning and then we're just beginning mm -hmm. a push um to for the new sports that will be introduced for los angeles you know 2028 which is very exciting so la 2028 again we can't we can't home. be more excited about that right? yeah. but yeah coming home but what most people don't realize is that even though los angeles is a seasoned vet you know of hosting olympic games this will be the first paralympics that um that they're bringing on board and what's paralympics educate our um, audience i so, have to have so to the, interrupt because this way yeah yeah so the, the paralympic games are games that provide sport opportunity and competition at the highest level for athletes with disabilities right and although you know you, you would hear it called parasport adaptive sport you know it, it, there are uh, that's probably the most inclusive right of any any um areas of sport because you don't have to necessarily be a person living with disability to enjoy adaptive sport, right? Sitting volleyball or goalball. Goal ball. I'm, I'm a huge, like, new fan to goalball where it's for the visually impaired, right? And you play with, I mean, you can get hit in the face with a ball if you're not careful, right? But I, I don't know, there's something about that that makes me feel like, wow, well, okay. That's but that like goalball is like an equalizer. Thing. Right. It's an ultimate equalizer. Yeah, yeah. It's, oh, it's, a, it's a softer ball, obviously. But the, at the Paralympic level, um, which I got involved in through sitting volleyball, right? I'd always been a fan of the different disciplines of, you know, disabled sport in volleyball in particular, but um, it wasn't until, you know, more recently, just before the Rio Paralympics that I got a chance to become involved, right? And to to sort of like the whole theme of our, our um, you know, our whole discussion or conversation, um, it was actually a, a former male colleague you know, who ran the 2000 Sydney Olympics for volleyball, who's a sport manager for volleyball, beach volleyball, and sitting volleyball. Nice. Um, and he's the president of World Paravolley. His name is Barry Kuzner from Australia. And okay. I have had, you know, such a terrific uh, relationship with Barry and such great experience working with him, you know, in, in all areas of volleyball, right? Beach, indoor. I was a supplier when I first met him. I was a sponsor, you know. So we've sort of like gone the whole cycle, right, as, as friends and colleagues. But, um, you know, an opportunity was made for me by by him, like you know, and and I I'm so grateful um, to get more involved in in the you know operations of sitting volleyball events, to be a, a technical official, you know, at the Paralympics, but now in this role that I have as sport director, to actually play a role on the board and in leadership, right, of an international federation, and you'd be surprised how very few women are either leading a federation involved in leadership of a federation or you know in any decision making capacity so this is a really unique you know opportunity and to speak to like how you do it right barry has not only you know opened the door for me it's up to me right to to be qualified and, and do everything else and do a good job but um you know barry made the opportunity he's um opened up the door to some uh professional you know education um continuing education opportunities you know with the with the international paralympic committee and with different organizations and now it's you know it's time to give back right so but unfortunately like most of parasport uh leadership is based in europe so the calls are <laughs> at a really difficult time of the day for us here in the uh you know in the western hemisphere but um yeah it's, we, it's we exciting time, time to have everything other, crossing right? over yeah yeah, yeah. like um, but that's why for me it was yeah. i mean first of all anything connected with lavbc is you know definitely jumps the queue to yeah. the priority you know, the, the high priority and that's why i was so 
uh, you know, really so fortunate that we were able to get together. I mean, I took my negative test. I'm vaccinated three times. I did everything I that you all have yeah. been doing, right? To stay yeah. safe. I'll pass my COVID test. test together. <laughs> got yeah, a, exactly. Got a 65. And, <laughs> and that once, yeah, and we got yeah, right. And, and when something means that much to you, you think about the people that are involved and you do what is necessary mm -hmm. to do, right? To be able to get together and, and um, you know, be together yeah. in person. Did you get it yet? Uh, did you get COVID yet? I, you know, I did. Um, and that's a, that's a personal early, question to some people. Yeah, but. no, and that's okay. I mean, or so early on in, in um, it was, I think it was October of uh, 20, I, I'm totally messed up with the years now, but it was October um, 2020, 2020 probably, yeah. that I had uh, what would be considered a mild case and they, it would be considered also long haul. So for a, oh, uh, almost a year after. You're like, I I'm had, still positive. Um, yeah. yeah, well, I wasn't positive. So I tested negative. I, I, I you know, tested out. Um, I was sick for about seven days and it was just like everything, now, all the symptoms, right. With that list of 14 symptoms, like I had like, you know, 14 and a half and, yeah. and it lasted for, you know, about a solid week. And then I started to, you know, to, to feel a lot better. But since then, you know, I, I test regularly. I, um, I, you know, I take care or I, I you know, I, I kind of am a caregiver for my mother who's in her seventies, who is a, um, who's in remission from cancer. And so right. just as an, as you know, out of an abundance of caution anyway, right. You not even to. considering yeah. COVID like we'd mask and gloves and hygiene, you know, all, all the things just because, you know, she's immunocompromised. Right. Yeah. That's, um, I mean, that's, so it wasn't, that's, it wasn't really, a, that's yeah. what we're trying to do anyway. That's exactly. If that's, yeah. if that's where they say we're trying to do this is, this right. is the, uh, the perfect example. Yeah. It kind of grosses me out that we have to remind people to wash their hands. Right. I mean, that shouldn't we be doing that anyway, yeah. but, but, you know, maybe it takes a zombie so, apocalypse yeah. to, so I'm, to do I'm some very, Purell. <laughs> yeah, I'm very, you know, cautious about it. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm not beyond taking my travel size Lysol can with me to the grocery store and like, you know, I'll spray you in the face if you cough on me, but you know, <laughs> but for the most part, it's really just trying to do, you know, my part, right. Yeah. To minimize, you know, even if it was flu season, I'd be doing the same thing if it was cold and flu season. You know, yeah, that's, and just... I say spray them in the face. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I mean, if I, there's I, any case for my, textbook. I got my hand sanitizer. In fact, my, my great friend Kalina from Paul Mitchell they take systems, you to, you know? They take you to court. That's textbook self-defense. Exactly. The threat exactly. is imminent. <laughs> well, I mean, you saw the other night, you know, I had my Paul Mitchell hand sanitizer, yes. right? And Kalina was so sweet oh, to send, you know, all full. the hand sanitizer to, uh, to all the girls and, you know, for the first aid kits and everything. But I mean, you yeah. know, wash your goddamn hands, people. Yes. I mean, that shouldn't be a campaign or a political slogan or, you know, whatever, yeah. right? Wash your hands. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> look, just because Omicron is highly contagious doesn't mean we should be working on ways to get it, okay? Right, right. That's right. ridiculous, right? Like, <laughs> uh, two weeks ago, like, everyone in my family got it. Right. Oh, me, no. my wife and my daughter. Um, so I had the first two vaxes. My wife had um, she's triple and my daughter zero, zero vax. And yeah, uh, one day of half day fever. And then that was it. So and, and again, it's highly contagious. But um, since this virus attacks fat cells and this and that, and my girl, my wife doesn't have two ounces of fat on her. I think the problem, the one that probably caught it the worst was me because I'm the one that kept testing positive. I was asymptomatic, <laughs> and it's like seven days later, I'm still positive. And I'm, I'm just like, I don't oh, feel no. shit. I don't feel <laughs> shit. What, what, why am I, on? I? I just want to go back to work. You know, I just yeah, want to coach, yeah. right? So. Um, well, yeah. I've seen I've seen it all. Like I have yeah. colleagues. In, well, I, I a high school teacher of mine died, you know, from from complications due to you right. know COVID, which um, is the high percentage of the deaths. That, exactly, that, um, you know, people... and and early on, you know, obviously before people knew how it was transmitted or what degrees of separation or you know what what variants and all that. Um, so, but I've also seen people who. Um, you know, are sort of in denial about it. They get sick and they think, oh, no problem. I've seen people on respirators and ventilators. So for yeah. me, it's like, okay, I can only control what I can control, right, right. myself. So I've chosen, yes, to get vaccinated, yeah. to wear a mask. I don't feel like it's an oppression of my freedom or anything else, but oh. I do understand that there might be some people who do. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. again, again, I'm going to spray you with no, my, my travel size Lysol that I keep in Twice. my pocket. <laughs> Twice. Just because just the threat is imminent doesn't mean you get, don't get to shoot them twice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you don't got to right? shoot them I once. Mean, That's not a, a proportional response when it yeah. comes to your life. <laughs> and, I, and I am somebody who went from traveling about 250 days yeah. a year for my job to taking a year and a half of zero plane travel. Right. Yep. And yeah. everyone thought, oh, you must be in withdrawal. I'm like, oh, I love it. You well, know, this is the well, most time I've... I've spent where I actually have an address. You know, most yeah. of I've spent in the same city in, in decades, right? I'm, I'm loving this whole stay at home. Thing. Well, I'm sympathetic yeah. to the people who are in denial because the majority of the people who are in denial it usually derives from um, paranoia, 
-hmm. that everything was COVID, right? right I'm so right, once, so right. someone had to get to a denial uh, from a point of 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 a, either a polar opposite or a gradual buildup that leads them to that, right? Like for, yeah. you just said, fourteen symptoms, right? What the fuck? I'm I'm looking on my list. Hmm. So Lori, there it is. Ready? I know, right? So Lori, do you do you go to bed at night and wake up the next morning? It's like, oh shit! I got it. I got I got that. I got that. I'm positive. Oh, so uh, I mean, so the, uh, you, I, I mean, if we step back after spraying them and and mm -hmm. we're socially distanced and we're in a we're in a, another a half mile right in the conf confines of our own home, we do take time to reflect and be like, right. okay, I get it. Don't come. Don't don't touch me. <laughs> Right. Don't touch I'll, me. I'll shoot you with my lysol. I, I got no problem with that. I, I buy it by the case. And twice. <laughs> and once should not be considered the proportional response. Right. Twice. Right. To, yeah, double tap. Double right? tap. <laughs> yes. My father, when I grew up, my father said, if someone steps in my face mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and I feel threatened, hit him. He said right. two piece them. It's not I mean, because I grew up with kind of this Catholic Lutheran thing where like the, the priest or the uh, the teachers like, all right, who 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 took the, who who um who swung first? Who took the first punch? And whoever swung first, it was your fault. So right. you right. so you had some kind of rule of engagement, but not my father said no. When in doubt, give him a two piece. <laughs> pow pow. Pow pow. You know? Double or tap. Jorge Masvidal would say a three piece and a soda, <laughs> right? <laughs> One two and then three <laughs> and then. <laughs> so unbelievable. You know, you know, you got to come back on, right? I know, I know, we we got like shit to do or whatever, but. <laughs> I, you have to come back on for two reasons and let's make it like after Huntington weekend because Huntington weekend was is the NCAA beach championships. It's indoor mm -hmm. semis right. and finals, all of that happening in one weekend. Well, it's not Huntington this year, uh, we, but I called it Huntington weekend because that's where I had to be the coach. I, 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 I didn't get to go to the, you know, the beach. It's, Gulf the, it's Shore, a classic, so. uh, it's a classic yeah. NCAA beach on the east, in the southeast and so, the NCAA men's at UCLA, right? Yes. <laughs> it's a classic. So Lori, I didn't get to both. So Lori, you and me, let's Let's get together and talk more about that because we'll have so much to talk about and we wanted to i really wanted to touch on uh more gary and eric sato stuff um that from 84 to 88 and 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 all of the things that shaped our volleyball dna um yeah, lastly yeah. i have a project coming up called i heart volleyball um which uh, i mean someone it, you know everything and maybe you know about it you don't but we've we've kept it really really quiet it's basically we're going to be live streaming um, beach volleyball, indoor volleyball, Central Park volleyball, Texas volleyball, 21 different live streams from 14 countries. Wow, um, and, very cool. And we're all on we're all on board. So my position is I'm in charge of the volleyball portion of that. So talk to Seydou Ajanako. He's mm -hmm. in Ghana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I talked to Sharif, um, had him on the podcast. He's in. Uh, talk so to uh, great. Rangiri, Alex. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. I want to get with him. And of course, New York, I have roots. I talked to Danny Moy, who's, a, I think, the president of the Strangers uh, for Chinese okay. Nine Men. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we know about some Chinese Nine Men. I mean, yes, don't yes, make me show yes, the videos, people. I was just telling somebody yeah. to look up Chinese Nine Men because they didn't believe me that yeah. it was that A, it was a thing, and B, that you literally played on the street. It's not, I put, <laughs> well, tell them I put up a YouTube video because it was the first time they did Chinese Nine Men indoor. It was at American yeah. Sports Center. It was 2000, me, 2016. It was Smash from San Francisco against Connex and uh, Toronto. And it was the first time they they did Chinese nine men indoor because it's outdoor and it's hard top. Yeah. And, and, well, in I'll, I'll, and the women I'll do see, indoor. Huh? I'll see your Chinese nine men and I'll raise you Japanese mama san nine on nine. Yes. And they will kick your ass yes. they're that good yep they're that good we hosted don't get me wrong i can use a good ass kicking but i think oh, no, i'm gonna pass you know, they, on this one <laughs> to talk about longevity in sports right yeah. they've changed the rules to i mean there was a woman who was 92 years old playing right. in this tournament in in japan right yep. i mean it's fascinating fascinating you know the first organization the first sports federation in japan to be entirely run by women mama san mm. volleyball yeah it's fascinating I like I, I and people I, people have to be reminded that volleyball was what 1896, right? Mm -hmm. Is that it? 1995. Volleyball yeah, was originally yeah. nine person, nine men. People don't know that. It was originally nine men. It wasn't sixes. Nope. So, some people should know. Let me put a nice little picture up on you as you as a segue to the continuation of what we want to do. 
There's a great shot oh, of you no. from Power Olympics. This is Tokyo. That's a great look at you. You're like in a suit. You're in a lot of trouble. I thought you were going to court. I know. You know I thought you were going so to funny. court instead of a volleyball game. Okay, man. So you know that that is our official formal uniform, right? From the from the games from Tokyo Paralympics and an Olympics. It was the same. And well, I really like that because for the first, even though the two organizations are completely separate, you know, Olympic Committee and the Paralympic Committee. Um, I like when there is cooperation, you know, and, and and to be able to showcase right both logos, right? And Tokyo was great, but but it's so funny, like that, you know, you get the um, I, I played different roles at at the games, right? And this one was actually working, you know, uh, uh, in the competition area, right? So I had to have the official uniform and everything. And I mean, the, a lot gets lost in translation. I remember when the FIVB changed uniform suppliers, we used to have these god awful yellow shirts, which they still have, you know, but it was um it's like such a low self so high self-esteem moment when you see the translation of the sizes you know and the average size is 5xl which is like a small in you know american sizing right and it's like oh man i do not want to be the like japanese a for you or, that's the thing right but i mean you know there's always that trepidation right when, when you sign up for these multi-sport you know endeavors you have to get a uniform and what if they don't offer tailoring and what if they don't you know have this like oh my god i gotta go on a diet you know my uniform's not gonna fit um but it's just you know it's so hilarious because it's been a while since i've been on that side of the the competition you know so it's it's been like since 2019 since i've had to do a uniform fitting right for the thing and freaking out right and i put the first you know the the sizing they give you right i put the first jacket on and there's like this there's like four inches of arm you know <laughs> like, like traveling down you know and it just oh my god that's probably the most stressful part of of the olympics and paralympics is the uniform fitting <laughs> yeah i, I always like long sleeves when i played yeah i went from long sleeve to no sleeve you know oh we're talking yeah. about like you could i mean this was this was it it was unbelievable. Like yeah. the jacket was too big. The pants were too big. I mean, it was, I would, I could wear my sweatpants and put the, the formal pants on. Right. Yeah. So then they kind of look at me like, okay, you, did you fill out these sizes yourself or did somebody else fill them out for you? fall but, off. Right. Yeah. Oh when I put in Germany, it was the opposite. Everything was tight. I had long, tight. Sleeve, yeah, long sleeves tight. and these high and tight shorts. And I had like the little spandex on it. So the yeah. spandex is sticking out of the shirt. So it's kind of, it's kind of a hot mess. There's but, some fun horror stories from yeah. every game. <laughs> so listen, you have to come back on because we, I did want to talk about Rio. The crowd in mm -hmm. Rio um, and sure. the, the cheer against thing, which is very much like the UFC, very much like mixed martial arts. So yeah. I want to talk about some of the challenges that you had going there. And I think that deserves to be at least a huge chunk of a part of another episode on its own. I want to talk about Gary and Eric. I want to, um, we're going to talk about these 14 symptoms. <laughs> so much to talk about i heart volleyball and we want to talk about some of the other challenges that were um that i edited out of this podcast that were hot button topics but i don't want to talk about that thing just for um shock value that i that's not how yeah. I, that's yeah. not how i do my podcast that's not how i operate and the only reason why i brought it up and and, and again people will know what i'm talking about off camera when and y'all could call me about it come see me um it's, it's highly personal to me because um say because say sport wise there there's different cultures in new york and there's different cultures in california right like mm -hmm, like if a game right. is over and a kid's waiting for their parents at starbucks in california a coach sees them she's fine if, a, if in new york if if a guy goes by a coffee shop and a girl's waiting for her parents at starbucks he's like are you crazy i'm waiting i'm not yeah. you ain't i'm not here you know no <laughs> so there there's not a one size fits all as far as say sport is, is is concerned and and the cool thing about say sport is when in doubt call somebody when in doubt report it and right. this way because if you report it right uh you learn and yeah. rules get modified and rules get understood and rules get tightened and 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 how, how old is safe sport don't ignore it well the you know it the U.S. Center for Safe Sport came online in, in 2017, you know, in March of 2017. And oh, talk the, about but timing, the concept, huh? yeah, but the concept of safeguarding, you know, or safe sport, you know, is is has actually been around, you know, as, as long as sport has. The only problem is it hasn't been widely understood, you know, what it means. The practices have been sort of left up to, um, you know, OK, well, what do you think we should do? Right. Club director or coach. You know, the, really the, the basic message is don't ignore something that happens, right? The, the, um, the movement now of people who are coming forward and, and talking about, 
you know, experiences where they've been jeopardized or abused or, you know, in any way, shape or form. Um, you know, the average person who um, has been victimized or is a survivor and reports is in their 50s by the time, you know, for an incident that could have happened when they were um, when they were children. Well, that's because yeah. their their psychological growth was stunted, and they didn't know why, and they didn't figure right. out until later on. It's you trauma. Know, I had about dude. I had about with my piano teacher that I didn't figure out how that shaped me until mm -hmm. I was like thirty three, until I was divorced, and then and and then I had to really just look at some stuff. I was you just have to process, right? Yeah. I mean, it takes time to process and understand. But you know, as far as um, you know what some of the, the how I got involved was through my volunteerism to USA Volleyball, you know, serving on their board, and we can talk about that. You know, it's a whole other podcast, but in a nutshell, and we will, what, we have, we yeah, have. We it's will. important. Yeah, Do you yeah. See, and I'm no longer involved. Important. You know, I'm no longer on the board. I'm no longer involved. You know, with USA Volleyball, but the lessons that I learned, you know, mm -hmm. through that experience, you know, have have sort of like piqued my interest in the area of safeguarding, and so I just recently accepted. Uh, a trustee position with Safe Sport International, which is more focused on like fact-based research, um, education, and connecting the dots between international sports federations and organizations, humanitarian, philanthropic, you know, and that. Um, connecting the dots among uh, offenders that, that, you know, what, what does it look like? What are the grooming practices? But also there are some offenders in specific countries that have been banned from sport, including ours in the US and volleyball, right? That I have seen you know, sitting courtside in another country, leading a national team program, or you know, on a on a trip with kids that were the same age as the victims that were abused, you know, at the time of the abuse, right? So that's a big problem. In you know, in in our own country, it's a big problem of of people going from sport to sport. But it becomes an even larger problem, you know, at the international level because the countries aren't talking to each other. You know, safe sport in every country is not um, governed or overseen by the same entities. Right, whether it's no. law enforcement or government or private, you know, sector. So, um, so it's a really big area of interest for me because I learned a lot. You know, when I was when I was um, involved in the governance at USA Volleyball, I learned a lot before that. I saw a lot as a club coach and a club director. You know, in all different iterations of my life. You know, in that. Um, but really, what it what for me it comes down to is the the kids, you know, that I meet almost, you know, monthly, daily, weekly, you know, the, the coaches that I meet, um, I don't want to see something happen to them as have happened to others that yeah. I've met in the past, right? But, if there's a way we can prevent it, then yeah. we should prevent it. Right? And again, it's something that they don't know until later. This is right. a very tricky thing. We, we can't yeah. call yeah. anything scientific fact. All we can do is collect data and, and, and examine patterns of data and have an opinion right. based on data, which is close to fact as, as, as fact is possibly gonna be in that instance, right? Like, right. Um, like if you're molested by your, your music teacher and you're failing science class be, after that, everyone's like, what does one thing have to do with the other? Maybe nothing, but maybe everything. But maybe everything, yeah. But maybe everything. I mean, it really you know? maybe everything, yeah. Yeah, you ever yeah, see Silence of the Lambs? And we can finish yeah. the podcast that oh, way. Oh yeah. <laughs> Remember Silence of the Lambs when Terrifying. <laughs> well, for people listening, Silence of the Lambs is this this rookie uh, FBI agent trying to make a name for herself. Go and go get sent in by a bunch of vets to do a questionnaire for um, a shrink who's also a, a serial killer. Um, eats his victims, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, just stay with the questionnaire. You don't want this guy in your head. So basically, she doesn't do that. He gets in her head and while the whole time he's trying to figure out a way to escape, he's treating her as a patient. So skipping ahead, basically, she had this thing where she was growing up where her uncle used to slaughter lambs and she didn't want him to slaughter the lambs. So one night she let them all out. The uncle got very angry at her and sent them away, sent her away and eventually killed all the lambs. And she just kept having nightmares and nightmares and nightmares about these lambs screaming at night. Probably like sound like a baby. You, you, I mean, you ever, if everyone's ever have a, have a kid, you're like, I can't take it. I can't take it. You know, put headphones on. I can still hear this little thing. Um, but the question, and this is this is definitely how we're going to finish. Mm -hmm. He said, do you feel like if you catch Buffalo Bill, because he's helping her catch another serial killer. A serial killer, right? That the that you that the lambs will stop screaming and you'll stop having these nightmares. And she goes, I don't know. And he yeah. goes, Thank you, Clarice. But and that's answer. and that's it. 
all we can do through ret retrospective action is self-examine, see what's connected, see what's not connected. And even if you ha don't have the answer, you'd be surprised how well your quality of life takes an ultimate reversal. Just, just look, just asking the question. Right. Just asking right. the question. Don't be scared to ask the question. Don't be scared of being gaslighted into or being shamed for anyone out there, 18 to 80. Don't be shamed asking yourself the question. Don't be shamed to, to, to think out loud because this is something that science uh, mm -hmm. is still trying to understand. And that's yeah. how I wanted to finish. Is there something you wanted to say? No, I, I mean, that's a perfect way to say, you know, to finish, but then to segue into another discussion, you know, about that because you know, I can tell you firsthand, you know, for me, the lambs don't stop screaming, right? And, and, and um, I had to really think, you know, when I, when I was finished with my whole experience, you know, with, with USA Volleyball and some safeguarding practices there, I had to really think about, could I continue, right, to, to advocate for these survivors and, and whatnot? I had to find a different vehicle to do that. In, right? I had to find some allies and I had to, I had to reconcile with the fact that I can't do it all. You know, and that, and nobody can do it all, right? So then you have to pick the place that you think you might be able to affect the most change, you know, long term. And for me, that's twofold. It's one getting into the international side of safe sporting so that there can be some connectivity, right? Trying to help, whether it's trying to help countries develop their own safe sport program or trying to align countries that already do have safe sport programs so there can be some communication. We've already caught several people that have been banned in one country and tried to, you know, and, and were successful in getting into professional or right. elite level sports in another. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the, the thing I would want to end on today, you know, that, that speaks to that question, right? That last question is part of the process, right? Is sharing, um, you know, the knowledge and, or just being uh, an advocate or an ally, you know, for these young, these young people, right? Whether it's girls or boys or, any, you know, anybody, right? A young person um, who needs that support, right? Who needs that to hear that, okay, it's not always going to be this way or this, you know, this happened to me too, or, you know, whether it's bullying or, or, you know, discrimination or whatever it is, digging down into the place that, you know, where it starts, right? The, the young kids, you know, it's, it's, um, I think that's probably for me, at least the place that I found that continuing to share with these youngsters, continuing to um, give them other examples of other people who have ascended to some pretty, you know, interesting things in their life. Okay, great. If they can pick up, if these kids can pick up even just a tiny percent, you know, of what we're talking about, then, okay, that's one more um, tool that they have, you know, in their toolbox that they can use when they move forward. And then maybe with that shared knowledge, you know, they don't become a victim. They don't become, you know, um, uh, susceptible to, you know, to the grooming or to anything else. Like it all does tie in, right? And they also have to be surrounded, you know, by, by good culture, right? Plus people that are looking out for their best interests, like the, like the coaches. That, that exactly brings us right back to where we started our conversation and why it's so important, you know, what all of you are doing with Los Angeles Volleyball Club and other clubs like you that are trying to achieve that same culture, you know, and, and protection, right, for their, for their, their students, really, you know, for yeah. their athletes, for their students of the game. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, that's, yeah. you know, that's, like that's that. a lot to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Hey, why do you, to quote a few good men, why do you love them so much? Because they stand on a wall and they say nothing's going to hurt you tonight. Right. No, not on my watch. That's right. Not on my watch. Um, people want to know more about Lori Hakamura. They're like, I want to know more about this girl. I heard Jason do all this talking. Does she have a website? Does she have a YouTube page? Um, I don't want. I, I just want. I just want Lori. I don't want Jason and Lori. So where do people get to know you? Um, uh, the what's the your best what's, place is what's your I, I keep. I keep some social media presence as public. Like I'm on Twitter. You know, okay. Lori Oki. You know, for short. Um, mm -hmm. Happy to connect on LinkedIn if it's professional. Uh, I'm not really a big TikTok. <laughs> I, mean, I I I tried TikTok in the very beginning when man, I was in China for an crazy. event. And, yeah, I don't crazy. know, man. It's like ide <laughs> identity theft. It's like identity theft or something, you know. So anyway, um, but yeah, I mean, social media is a good way to find me. Um, I no longer have you know any sort of like you know website presence. I'm, I I when I closed my business, um, I sort of like took some time out right from from being in the public space like i said people only do, people don't know or don't need to know you know who i am but if you do want to connect the best ways would be you know through through social right i like that 
Cool. And with that being said, Laurie might love you guys, but me, I don't love you. In fact, I can't <laughs> stand you. In fact, I am out of here. So for all of you at home, for all of you on your iPad, for all of you on your desktop, who runs the world? Old school, baby. For all of you on your droid, uh, for Laurie Akamura, this is episode... <laughs> 127 of the option podcast stay with me i'm gonna hit my music but for now we're out come check out the option podcast on optiondb.com it's also available on itunes and spotify and on youtube under the ny varsity sports handle you're gonna love what you hear